Hello, hello. All right, so I'm streaming this live, so I'm going to give it some time for people to get in here to make sure that the stream's all working. This is the first stream that I've done in too long. So I want to make sure that everything connects right. And there isn't really a good way to do that without just going live. So let's check YouTube and see if YouTube is working. And it looks as if it is not. Let's check Facebook and see if it's working. And it looks as if it is. Okay, let's check Twitter and see if it's working. And it appears that it is. So for some reason, YouTube isn't working. And that's the one that's the most important. So let's go figure out why that's the case. Ah, it is. Okay. So for whatever reason, it didn't show up at first. But now it is. Let me refresh here and see if it just took a minute. Okay. All right. There it is. All right, what's up, guys? Apologies for the uh, housekeeping here at the beginning. But this is, as I said, the first time I've done this in a little while. And uh, I have lost all the muscle memory that I once had. So let me grab a link here and throw it in all the appropriate places. Oh, my God. I just heard my voice. I don't like that. All right. <clears throat> How are you guys doing? Long time no talk. It's very awkward sitting here with nobody else on the other. Uh, someone text Matt. <laughs> with nobody else there to talk to. I'm just sitting here talking to my own voice, which is kind of strange. Nick, what's up, man? He says, I demand to know what streaming software you're using. I am using Restream. Restream.io. That is the best thing that I have encountered yet. I'm happy for people to suggest something else to me if they think it would be better. I think that I'm paying 20 bucks a month maybe for the ability to stream to these different platforms at the same time. What's up, Jacob? Long time no see. Indeed. We have a lot to catch up on. Uh, I'm very, very bad at staying in contact with people. Um, so I, I apologize for that. Let me jump onto Twitter here real quick and uh wrong twitter account so get to the right twitter account and throw this link in here this is i understand that this is not remotely fascinating to you guys but that's what you get for showing up early we like to reward our most faithful viewers with the most tormentous experience all right and the last place that I need to copy and paste actually two more spots. All right, one here and one over here in the Discord, which speaking of, we would love to have you there. Um, if you go to, you can uh, uh, join our subscribe star, subscribestar.com forward slash king pill, king pilled. And uh, you will. Uh, once you sign up there, then you'll get added to our, our private Discord server, which is where I spend the vast majority of my time on the internet. It's a very good place, full of very good people, and we have all sorts of different things that we talk about there, ranging from um, <laughs> some stuff that I can't talk about on YouTube if I want to keep my YouTube channel, and um, the ordinary stuff about diet and fitness and uh, schizo threads from Twitter and all kinds of different stuff. So if you'd like to join that, we would love to have you in there. Subscribestar.com slash kingpilled. We'll get that done. So that's your first ad for the day. Then I've got a couple more that I'm going to I'm gonna read for you guys here before we get started. That way I don't have to stop in the middle at all and uh, should make for a better listening experience once you've survived the, um, the torment of me doing an, a live ad read on the fly. So, okay, got that one in place. Why do I look sad? Um, I don't know. I don't feel sad. I'm focused. Maybe I just have like a sad looking focused face. Um, I can't help you with that. Sorry, women. 
All right. So the first, oh, hold on. What's going on here? Why aren't you working? Okay. All right. You are working. Okay, great. All right. So um, what I'm going to read uh, today is, um, as you can see from the description of the video here, is the first two chapters of the Benedict Option, a strategy for Christians in a post-Christian nation by Rod Dreher. I have, I know that I'm like the last person in the world to read this book. I've heard a ton about it for the last several years. Uh, different people recommending it, different people complaining about it. Uh, so I'm, I'm late to the party on this one. I was just looking for something that seemed like it was kind of compelling, but also wasn't going to be really mentally taxing that I could just kind of listen to and um, maybe get a little inspiration from. And I, I, I think I, I bought the audio book like, I don't know eight months ago, long time ago, I bought the audiobook and just haven't done anything with it. So I turned it on and started listening. And um, I got through the first chapter and it was like, okay, yeah, this is pretty interesting. This is an interesting, interesting book. And then the second chapter just absolutely rocked my world, blew me away completely. It is a summation of basically everything that I've been thinking for the last year or so. This whole little kind of journey that I've gone on in my own head, trying to um, dig into the depths of of the history of the evolution of liberalism or something like that. Um, the thing that led me back to Orthodox Christianity, all of that he summed up in an entire page or not an entire page, but an entire um, uh, chapter. And it just is in the most concise, just mm, he just just lays it out so beautifully. There's a few different points that it, that he didn't cover that I'll see if I can remember to inject in as I'm reading here. But um, he he really just like if I, I wish I would have read this a year ago and I would have saved myself a year. But as it is, um, there are some people who learn from other people's mistakes, and then there's some people who learn from their own mistakes, and then there's some people who don't learn from their own mistakes. And I'm somewhere between category two and category three. I don't learn from other people's mistakes. I have to make all the mistakes myself. So uh, I, I probably it probably wouldn't have been as profound to me if I hadn't thought all of it first. This is what's really interesting about reading a really good book is, in my experience at least, it seems like the stuff that is that is the most compelling, the stuff that really jumps out and grabs me is people putting into words stuff that I was already thinking, but I hadn't figured out how to put into words like that. Um, so it's it's kind of like listening to other people thinking my thoughts and and then presenting them in a in a really easy to digest manner. Those are the best books to me. And that's what the first couple chapters of this book are. Now, going past this book, I'm or past these first couple chapters of the book, I've got mixed feelings. I really agree with some of the stuff he's talking about and then I I agree less or I would maybe take a, a a slightly different focus than he does. And maybe this is the, the, the cause for a series covering this book and we can do multiple episodes uh, breaking this stuff down. But um, anyway, so uh, let me know if the audio is okay. Sometimes my microphone just decides that it's not going to work and I'll be sitting here talking with like the Mac mini microphone picking it up. So let me know if everything sounds right. Let me blow out the headphones, wears ears real quick. Um, yeah, let me know if everything sounds good um, before I really get into it. I'm going to, yep, perfectly good. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to tell you about uh, a couple of our sponsors. One of them you've heard about before. Uh, you've heard about it many times, and I see people discussing it here in the in the comments. Carlos and Jacob are going back and forth about it. So uh, that is Paloma Verde. So when I first started talking about Paloma Verde here, I first met met Carlos and he introduced me to his products and I started started advertising him on the show here. The stuff that I was really focused on was the not the topical stuff, it was like the stuff that goes in. So the um the gummies, which I've got a empty thing of gummies here just finished. Um fantastic sour, uh, green apple um THC CBD gummies. Um they're not THC. It says THC on there and my mind was reading it. They're CBD gummies. Uh and the um, what do you call it? Like the tincture. They've got a fantastic tincture. Um, they've got dog treats. Uh, they've got all kinds of stuff. Um, but the, the stuff that I actually hadn't really taken advantage of was the topical stuff. And I'd heard, um, good friend of the show, Buck Johnson talked about this, the, the premium THC free CBD sports cream. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to leave that alone, John. 
John, uh, the plumber has, has weighed in on suppositories. Um, I was going to ask about the day job and suppositories anyways. So this stuff here, Buck Johnson raved about it. He said he would rub this stuff on his back and, or whatever aching muscle he had. And it would just, just like that, it'd be gone. And, um, I'm always a little skeptical. So I'm kind of like, okay, you know, that makes a great, that makes a great sales pitch. You know, it's, it's very compelling. And who are you going to, you're not going to question someone for saying that. And I wouldn't question Buck's honesty. He's one of the most sincere, genuine human beings I've ever encountered. But I was like, okay, this sounds like it's, it's a really great sales pitch. Like it's a way to really vouch for a product that you believe in that you get a, a lot of a positive benefit from. And then I got some of it and I started using it. I have regular, like, like tension headaches and, and it'll turn into migraines sometimes. And it's all around the back of my neck and my shoulders. I'm, I'm kind of fighting with one today. And this stuff here is insane. I don't know what it is, but just one little pump of it rubbed around, like, actually, you know what? I'm going to do it right here. Cause it's kind of fighting. So that much, just a little tiny, yeah, I know the white stuff on my hand, just a little tiny thing here. I'm going to rub it, get it up underneath the hair here. Just rub it right around the base of my neck, the edge of my shoulders. Just kind of get it up in there. It's cool menthol, so it's got a little bit of a cooling effect, kind of tingly, and it feels great. Um, So I rub it on there, and I guarantee you, I'm, you you're going to have to comment and ask me because I'm going to forget that my neck was hurting. It just, it's not like, it's not like really pronounced. It's just all of a sudden the thing that you were feeling before you don't feel anymore, and you Maybe an hour later, you realize, wait a second, I haven't felt that pain for a long time. This stuff's fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Um, <laughs> Cooper, I'm not going to do that. Um, I know you want me to, but I'm not. So if you'd like to get yourself some, I highly recommend it. If you have sore muscles, sore, I don't know, if your your calves bother you. I rubbed some on the backs of my knees this morning because I've got old man knees. Felt great after a little while. Um, if you'd like to get yourself some, then just go to palomaverdecbd.com and use promo code KING. You'll get yourself 25% off any order over $75. And I highly, highly recommend it. Um, especially, I'm, I'm guessing that the, the, the audience here is going to be, is typically overwhelmingly male. And we're all kind of right at that point where we're starting to realize that we're getting older faster than we planned on. And we're realizing that because our bodies are telling us about it. Well, get yourself some good CBD and take care of that. Um, okay. So then one other one, we've got a new sponsor, a new sponsor of the show. And this is one that, uh, uh, that, that I'm very excited about. I'm very excited to start um, getting this conversation out there. And I've, I've wanted to talk about it for a little while, but um, I've been, I've been wrapped up dealing with a bunch of my own issues and um still navigating and the, the moving and resettling in, in Texas and getting the new job off the ground and all those kinds of things. So my mind has been, has been elsewhere. I'm also a, a, a fledgling, um, I guess I'd just say fledgling Orthodox Christian and dealing with the, the various attendant issues that come with that. Typically a, a, uh, catechumenate is not an easy time. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you become very acutely aware of the spiritual warfare happening around you. And um, that's been occupying a lot of my bandwidth as well. But one of the goals with this show, when we first started it, I mean, when we first started the show, it was just us to uh, opportunity for us to just sit here and BS and banter about. Um, but long-term we realized that one of the biggest issues that we were seeing with our peer groups and people who seem to value a lot of the same things we did is that there was no, um, there was no action. There was no, um, personal investment. There weren't that people were just sitting around talking about things. They weren't actually getting out into their communities, into their careers, into whatever else they're doing away from the internet and, um, starting to make a difference there. And there's a bunch of different directions you can go with that. The direction that I have primarily felt drawn toward is uh, the personal, like personal self-development route. The, this is where the notion of king pill comes from. Taking the king pill means to uh, recognize the uh, the value of hierarchy and authority, and recognize the necessity for you as a man primarily to embody your role in the hierarchy. And that means taking kingship over your or, or accepting your kingship over your territory and 
making yourself into the best king that you can be. And that if we, if you're looking for a king, the best way to find one is to become one yourself. And then once you do, you'll start to notice all the others around you. That's been kind of the message. So it's been a more, I guess, kind of esoteric and more, more uh, inwardly directed message. However, a, there's a big gap that exists right now in the, uh, in the, in the American political system, but in American society in general. And we have the tendency coming from the background that we're going to talk about in the reading today, we have the tendency to look at these things from a, um, a, a purely political perspective. What, what's really needed is we need that political action, um, activism, that political action. We need people who are good enough to do that. We're, we're, we're suffering for lack of good, strong Christian men who will take leadership roles, who will take on those leadership roles, even if they don't feel qualified. If you don't feel qualified for the role, that's probably a, a pretty good indication you might be qualified for it. We need Christian men who are going to step into these positions of leadership and and um, begin taking on these roles to um, protect and defend and, uh, and uh, improve our communities. There's been a, a, a war on strong masculine leadership in this country for a long time now. And I mean, you can see the roots of it as we're going to read about today. The roots of it go back over a thousand years. It's been a, a steady, sustained chipping away. And so it's really good on one hand to do to, to be embodying the, 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 the spiritual, um, esoteric, individual component of the King Pilled message. Some people already have that. Some people have been there. They're not like, like I'm the, I feel like I'm the guy who's stumbling upon this obvious truth and I need to go spread it to all the other degenerates around me. Meanwhile, there are some people who have been embodying this truth and they didn't need to go read a bunch of books to learn it for themselves. They don't have, they're not dull like I am. They're sharp. So there needs to be avenues for both. There needs to be avenues for the, the individual personal self-development through the church. And then there needs to be the avenue for spiritual leadership in the community, spiritual political leadership in the community. There's going to be political leaders. The question is, are those political leaders only going to be completely given over to vice and corruption and the devil, or are there going to be powerful, moral, humble Christian leaders as well? So we have, we are partnered now with a fantastic organization that is, we've been partnered with them, but they have, they've been, uh, they've, they've turned up the, they've turned up the knob here just recently. Um, and they're working on that latter part. So uh, let me read the copy here. So it's, um, I want to tell you about the Mises Mayor's Pack, formerly known as Mises GOP. They're raising money to support Buck Johnson of the Counterflow Podcast for City Council. Buck is one of the best leaders our community has. I can vouch for this personally. Um, I went on an absolutely delightful date with the man uh, a week ago today, I believe. And um, it was it was just, mm, just fantastic. Wonderful sitting and talking to the man. Um, he is, um, honestly, he's not to make this too gay or anything, but he's, he's genuinely, uh, someone that I, I like, I look up to, I, 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 I want to model my life after his because of, um, how much I see the, the role, the, the way that he has really taken control of his life and, um, the discipline that he has. Wyman says he'll legally vote for Buck, which is great. We, we, and I'm not going to say something I was about to say, but good for you. Wyman. <laughs> Um, anyway, so Buck is one of the best leaders our community has. We saw in 2020 what happens when weak leaders are in charge and how having just one good guy in office can save many lives. Shout out Ron DeSantis. Mises Mayors works to put good Misesian men in office who will fight back against the Great Reset and will push local policies, such as contractually obligating cops to protect their citizens and passing town charter amendments stating that the government gets its legitimacy from property owners. I personally support the Mises Mayor's PAC because I truly believe this PAC has the right strategy created by HAPA. And I'm asking all of my listeners to support them by going to MisesGOP.org slash King and pledging a few dollars per month to support electing libertarians like Buck. All money raised will go towards electing officials. Not one cent will go to pay PAC leadership like other PACs do. And that policy will not change. 
by joining me and going to MisesGOP.org slash King and pooling thousands of small monthly donations, we can do what must be done and elect liberty-minded men like Buck. So we are very happy to support Mises Mayor's Pack, and we would like for you guys to help us in supporting the Mises Mayor's Pack to get people like Buck Johnson elected. Buck is not going to be the first one, and or is he, Buck is the first one, but he's not going to be the last one. There is a there is a, a plan in action that um can actually start making a tangible difference. We don't have to spend all of our time sitting around shit posting on Twitter. I'm not going to stop shit posting on Twitter, but it's good to have other um, other avenues as well. Okay, let me just catch up on some of the comments here real quick. Uh, Tyler, it's recognizing the value of embodying the king archetype. There you go. In a sentence, that the king pill is recognizing the value of embodying the king archetype. Uh, okay. I find it hilarious because Buck Johnson sounds like the name of a Japanese video game developer would give to the American guy in a video game. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. Uh, Carlos says, I'm dropping 500 bucks for Buck's run when his website is ready to take donations. I don't fuck around. Buck is a chingon in book. Interesting. That's an interesting phrase. Is that a typo or is that? I don't, I don't know what that means. We need him to win. We definitely do. Um, we're actually looking at hopefully getting relocated to Lockhart here or the Lockhart area within the next several months. We'd like to be a little closer. We don't want to have to drive 75 miles each way to church each Sunday. Okay. So it looks like everything else is still working all hunky dory here. So got all that out of the way. I'm going to share the screen. We're 20 minutes in, which is longer than I expected it to take, but best laid plans, you know? So let us do us a reading. So the Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation by Rod Dreher. Tab through all these pages. You can see the chapters. So we're going to read the introduction, which is short, and then uh, the first two chapters here. Let us arise then at last, for the scripture stirs us up, saying, Now is the hour for us to rise from sleep. Romans 13.11, from the rule of St. Benedict. Introduction, The Awakening. For most of my adult life, I have been a believing Christian and a committed conservative. I didn't see any conflict between the two until my wife and I welcomed our firstborn child into the world in 1999. Nothing changes a man's outlook on life like having to think about the kind of world his children will inherit, and so it was with me. As Matthew grew into toddlerhood, I began to realize how my politics were changing as I sought to raise our child by traditionalist Christian principles. I began to wonder what exactly mainstream conservatism was conserving. It dawned on me that some of the causes championed by my fellow conservatives, chiefly an uncritical enthusiasm for the market, can in some circumstances undermine the thing that I, as a traditionalist, considered the most important institution to conserve, the family. I also came to see the churches, including my own, as largely ineffective in combating the forces of cultural decline. Traditional, historic Christianity, whether Catholic, Protestant, or Eastern Orthodox, ought to be a powerful counterforce to the radical individualism and secularism of modernity. Now, um, I understand that the, the, our, our, our audience here has a, a wide range of, uh, of ideologies represented. Uh, there's some Orthodox, there's some Catholic, and there's some uh, Protestant, and there's some uh, none of the above. One thing you'll notice and that I appreciate, and I'm going to comment on more later, is the way that Dreyer, in writing on this subject, he, the way that he assumes the best of each person that he's talking about. He assumes that they're all sincere and that um, they 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 mean what they say. He takes them at their word. He does not. He's not really getting into purity spirals here, at least in these first couple of chapters that I've read. Um, so. When he says traditional historic Christianity, whether Catholic, Protestant, or Eastern Orthodox, he mentions Protestants in there, even though Protestants are much a much more recent development than Catholic or Orthodox. However, Protestants of 500 years ago, in terms of their values, would be radically conservative and traditionalist today. So there's still a dynamic here where um, traditional historic Christianity is much closer to the truth than much of what Christianity is today. And he's talking about what it ought to be. So um, when I first read that sentence, my, my brain quibbled with it a little bit. And then I, I kind of thought through what I just said and, and was like, okay, I see where this guy's coming from. Even though conservative Christians were said to be fighting a culture war, 
With the exception of the abortion and gay marriage issues, it was hard to see my people putting up much of a fight. We seemed content to be the chaplaincy to a consumerist culture that was fast losing a sense of what it meant to be Christian. In my 2000 book, 2006 book, Crunchy Cons, which explored a countercultural traditionalist conservative sensibility, I brought up the work of philosopher Alistair McIntyre, who declared that Western civilization had lost its moorings. The time was coming, said McIntyre, when men and women of virtue would understand that continued full participation in mainstream society was not possible for those who wanted to live a life of traditional virtue. These people would find new ways to live in community, he said, just as St. Benedict, the sixth century father of Western monasticism, responded to the collapse of Roman civilization by founding a monastic order. I called the strategic withdrawal prophesied by McIntyre the Benedict option. The idea is that serious Christian conservatives could no longer live business as usual lives in America, that we have to develop creative communal solutions to help us hold on to our faith and our values in a world growing ever more hostile to them. We would have to choose to make a decisive leap into a truly countercultural way of living Christianity, or we would doom our children and our children's children to assimilation. Over the last decade, I have been writing on and off about the Benedict Option, but it never took off outside a relatively small circle of Christian conservatives. Meanwhile, the millennial generation began to abandon the church in numbers unprecedented in U.S. history, and they almost certainly did not know what they were discarding. New social science indicated that young adults are almost entirely ignorant of the teachings and practices of the historical Christian faith. The steady decline of Christianity and the steady increase in hostility to traditional values came to a head in April 2015, when the state of Indiana passed a version of the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The act merely provided a valid religious liberty defense for those sued for discrimination. It did not guarantee that those defendants would prevail. Gay rights activists loudly protested, calling the law bigoted, and for the first time ever, big business took sides in the culture war, coming down firmly on behalf of gay rights. Indiana backed down under corporate pressure, as did Arkansas a week later. Notice, this was seven years ago. He's not talking about the 90s or the 2000s. He's not even talking about the early 10s. He's talking about 2015. That's, that, that, it's crazy that 2015 was when, um, as he says, the, uh, uh, da, 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 wow, the for, for the first time ever, big business took sides in the culture war. Now, I understand where he's coming from. That was definitely, as he says in the next sentence, a watershed event. I would argue that from a wider lens, big business has been taking sides in the culture war for a long time. There's still a little bit of the kind of he's there. Ironically, he's still got quite a bit of a fundamental liberal in him. He's still looking at the world through a liberal lens. Um, and so he, he still um, is appealing to the, the public private uh, distinction that doesn't really exist in, in, in actuality. But the point remains that, Seven years ago, having something happen where it becomes evident, even to someone steeped in the liberal mind, that big business is taking side in the culture war, that it took from seven years ago till now, so, so much has changed. Time is definitely accelerating. This was a watershed event. It showed that if big business objected, even Republican politicians in red states would not take a stand, even a mild one, for religious freedom. Professing orthodox biblical Christianity on sexual matters was now thought to be evidence of intolerable bigotry. Conservative Christians had been routed. We were living in a new country. And then two months later, the U.S. Supreme Court declared a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. The decision was popular with the American people, which had, over the previous decade, undergone a staggering shift on gay rights and same-sex marriage. No sooner was the right to gay marriage achieved than activists and their political allies, the Democratic Party, began pushing for transgender rights. This book was written in 2017, just for, for context. Post Obergefell, Christians who hold to the biblical teaching about sex and marriage have the same status in culture and increasingly in law as racists. It's a little kind of funny to say now. The culture war that began with the sexual revolution in the 1960s has now ended in defeat for Christian conservatives. The cultural left, which is to say increasingly the American mainstream, has no intention of living in post-war peace. It is, pressing forward with a, it is pressing forward with a harsh, relentless occupation, one that is aided by the cluelessness of Christians who don't understand what's happening. Don't be, don't be fooled. The upset presidential victory of Donald Trump has at best given us a bit more time to prepare for the inevitable. He's, he's definitely would fall into the camp of what you might call a never-Trump conservative. He's a little more nuanced than that, but he is definitely... Um, uh, his sensibilities are, are 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 outraged by by Trump for sure, which 
fair. Okay. Um, but just be aware of the perspective. I've written the Benedict option to wake up the church and to encourage it to act to strengthen itself while there is still time. If we want to survive, we have to return to the roots of our faith, both in thought and in practice. We are going to have to learn habits of the heart forgotten by believers in the West. We are going to have to change our lives and our approach to life in radical ways. In short, we are going to have to be the church without compromise, no matter what it costs. This book does not offer a political agenda, nor is it a spiritual how-to manual, nor a standard decline and fall lament. True, it offers a critique of modern culture from a traditional Christian point of view, but more importantly, it tells the stories of conservative Christians who are pioneering creative ways to live out the faith joyfully and counterculturally in these darkening days. My hope is that you will be inspired by them and collaborate with like-minded Christians in your local area to construct responses to the real-world challenges faced by the church. If the salt is not to lose its savor, we have to act. The hour is late. This is not a drill. Alistair McIntyre said that we await a new, doubtless very different, St. Benedict. The philosopher meant an inspired creative leader who will pioneer a way to live the tradition and community so that it can survive through a time of great testing. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI foretells a world, world in which the church will live in small circles of committed believers who live the faith intensely and who will have to be somewhat cut off from the mainstream society for the sake of holding on to the truth. Read this book, learn from the people you meet in it, and be inspired by the testimony of the lives of the monks. Let them all speak to your heart and mind, then get active locally to strengthen yourself, your family, your church, your school, and your community. In the first part of this book, I will define the challenge of post-Christian America as I see it. I will explore the philosophical and theological roots of our society's fragmentation, and I will explain how the Christian virtues embodied in the 6th century rule of St. Benedict, a monastic guidebook that played a powerful role in preserving Christian culture throughout the so-called Dark Ages, can help all believers today. In the second part, I will discuss how the way of Christian living prescribed by the rule can be adapted to the lives of modern conservative Christians of all rule, churches and confessions. To avoid political confusion, I use the word orthodox, small o, to refer to the theological, tradi theologically traditional Protestants, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox Christians. The rule offers insights in how to approach politics, faith, family, community, education, and work. I will detail how they manifest themselves in the lives of a diverse number of Christians who have lessons to teach the entire church. Finally, I will consider the critical importance of believers thinking and acting radically in the face of the two most powerful phenomena directing contemporary life and pulverizing the church's foundations, sex and technology. Think of, um, of the Nephilim there. It's an interesting observation. In the end, I hope you'll agree with me that Christians are now in a time of decision. The choices we make today have consequences for the lives of our descendants, our nation, and our civilization. Jesus Christ promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church, but he did not promise that hell would not prevail against his church in the West. That depends on us and the choices we make right here, right now. I invite you, the, the reader, to keep in mind as you make your way through these pages that maybe, just maybe, the new and quite different Benedict that God is calling to revive and strengthen his church is you. Chapter one, the great flood. No one saw the great flood coming. The newspaper said heavy rains were headed to South Louisiana that weekend in August, 2016, but it was nothing unusual for us. Louisiana is a wet place, especially in summer. The weathermen said that we could expect three to six inches over a five day period. By the time the rain stopped, the deluge had dropped over 30 inches of water on the greater Baton Rouge area. Places that no one ever imagined would see high water disappeared beneath the muddy torrent as rivers and creeks hemorrhaged and burst their banks. People fled their houses and made it to high ground with minutes to spare. Some had not even that much time and were lucky to clamber with their families onto their roofs where rescuers found them. I spent the Sunday of the flood at a makeshift shelter in Baton Rouge. My son Lucas and I helped unload the rescued from National Guard helicopters, and we joined scores of other volunteers in feeding and helping the thousands of refugees flowing in from the surrounding area. Men, women, families, the elderly, the well-off, the very poor, white, black, Asian, Latino. It was a real here-comes-everybody moment, and nearly every one of them looked shell-shocked. Serving jambalaya to hungry and dazed evacuees, one heard the same story over and over. We have lost everything. We never expected this. It has never flooded where we live. We were not prepared. These confused and homeless evacuees could be forgiven their lack of preparation. Few had thought to buy flood insurance, but why would they? The Great Flood was a thousand-year weather event, and nobody in recorded history had ever seen this land underwater. The last time something like this happened in Louisiana, Western civilization had not yet reached American shores. 
Yes, as Wyman said, everyone like and subscribe and share the show. We, Christians in the West, are facing our own thousand-year flood. Or, if you believe Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, a 1500-year flood. In 2012, the then pontiff said that the spiritual crisis overtaking the West is the most serious since the fall of the Roman Empire near the end of the 5th century. The light of Christianity is flickering out all over the West. There are people alive today who may live to see the effect of death of Christianity within our civilization. By God's mercy, the faith may continue to flourish in the global South and China, but barring a dramatic reversal of current trends, it will all but disappear entirely from Europe and North America. This may not be the end of the world, but it is the end of a world, and only the willfully blind would deny it. For a long time, we have downplayed or ignored the signs. Now the floodwaters are upon us, and we are not ready. The storm clouds have been gathering for decades, but most of us believers have operated under the illusion that they would blow over. The breakdown of the natural family, the loss of traditional moral values, and the fragmenting of communities. We were troubled by these developments, but believed they were reversible and didn't reflect anything fundamentally wrong with our approach to faith. Our religious leaders told us that strengthening the levies of law and politics would keep the flood of secularism at bay. The sense one had was, there's nothing here that can't be fixed by continuing to do what Christians have been doing for decades, especially voting for Republicans. Today, we can see that we've lost on every front and that the swift and relentless currents of secularism have overwhelmed our flimsy barriers. Hostile secular nihilism has won the day in our nation's government, and the culture has turned powerfully against traditional Christianity. We tell ourselves that these developments have been imposed by a liberal elite because we find the truth intolerable. The American people, either actively or passively, approve. The advance of gay civil rights, along with a reversal of religious liberties for believers who do not accept the LGBT agenda, had been slowly but steadily happening for years. The U.S. Supreme Court's Obergefell decision declared a constitutional right to same-sex marriage was the declaring a constitutional right to same-sex marriage was the Waterloo of religious conservatism. It was the moment that the sexual revolution triumphed decisively, and the culture war, as we have known it since the 1960s, came to an end. In the wake of Obergefell, Christian beliefs about the sexual complementarity of marriage of marriage are considered to be abominable prejudice, and in a growing number of cases, punishable. The public square has been lost. Not only have we lost the public square, but the supposed high ground of our churches is no safe place either. Well, so what if those around us don't share our morality? We can still retain our faith and teaching within the walls of our churches, we may think, but that's placing unwarranted confidence in the health of our religious institutions. The changes that have overtaken the West in modern times have revolutionized everything, even the church, which no longer forms souls, but caters to selves. It's a great line. No longer forms souls, but caters to selves. As conservative Anglican theologian Ephraim Radner has said, there is no safe place in the world or in our churches within which to be a Christian. It is a new epoch. Don't be fooled by the large number of churches you see today. Unprecedented numbers of young adult, adult Americans say they have no religious affiliation at all. According to the Pew Research Center, one in three 18 to 29-year-olds have put religion, put religion aside if they ever picked it up in the first place. If the demographic trends continue, our churches will soon be empty. Even more troubling, many of the churches that do stay open will have been hollowed out by a sneaky kind of secularism to the point where the Christianity taught there is devoid of power and life. It has already happened in most of them. In 2005, sociologists Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist Denton examined the religious and spiritual lives of American teenagers from a wide variety of backgrounds. What they found was that in most cases, teenagers adhered to a mushy pseudo-religion the researchers deemed moralistic therapeutic deism, or MTD. MTD has five basic tenets. A God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when he is needed to resolve a problem. Good people go to heaven when they die. This creed, they found, is especially prominent among Catholic and mainline Protestant teenagers. Evangelical teenagers fared measurably better, but were still far from historical biblical orthodoxy. Smith and Denton claimed that MTD is colonizing existing Christian churches, destroying biblical Christianity from within, and replacing it with a pseudo-Christianity that is, quote, only tenuously connected to the actual historical Christian tradition. MTD is not entirely wrong. After all, God does exist, and he does want us to be good. The problem with MTD, in both its progressive and its conservative versions, is that it's mostly about improving one's self-esteem and subjective happiness and getting along well with others. 
It has little to do with the Christianity of scripture and tradition, which teaches repentance, self-sacrificial love, and purity of heart, and commends suffering, the way of the cross, as the pathway to God. Though superficially Christian, MTD is the natural religion of a culture that worships the self and material comfort. As bleak as Christian Smith's 2005 findings were, his follow-up research, a third installment of which was published in 2011, was even grimmer. Surveying the moral beliefs of 18 to 23-year-olds, Smith and his colleagues found that only 40% of young Christians sampled said that their personal moral beliefs were grounded in the Bible or some other religious sensibility. It's unlikely that the beliefs of even these faithful are biblically coherent. And note, this is 40% of young Christians. This isn't 40% of young people. 40% of young Christians. So it's an even smaller subset. Many of these, quote, Christians are actually committed moral individualists who neither know nor practice a coherent Bible-based morality. An astonishing 61% of the emerging adults had no moral qualms at all with materialism and consumerism. An added 30% expressed some qualms, but figured it was not worth worrying about. In this view, say Smith and his team, quote, all that society is, apparently, is a collection of autonomous individuals out to enjoy life. What does that sound like? A collection of autonomous individuals out to enjoy life. Hmm. I feel like there's a single word that you could use to sum that up. These are not bad people. Rather, they are young adults who have been terribly failed by family, church, and the other institutions that formed, or rather failed to form, their consciences and their imaginations. MTD is the de facto religion, not simply of American teenagers, but also of American adults. To a remarkable degree, teenagers have adopted the religious attitudes of their parents. P teenagers have adopted the religious attitudes of their parents. We have been an MTD nation for some time now. America has lived a long time off its then Christian veneer, partly necessitated by the Cold War, Smith told me in an interview. That is all finally being stripped away by the combination of mass consumer capitalism and liberal individualism, close quote. The data from Smith and other researchers make clear what so many of us are desperate to deny. The flood is rising to the rack in church. Every single congregation in America must ask itself if it has compromised so much with the world that it has been compromised in its faithfulness. Is the Christianity we have been living out in our families, congregations, and communities a means of deeper conversion, or does it function as a vaccination against taking faith with the seriousness the gospel demands? Nothing but the most deluded of the old school religious right believes that this cultural revolution can be turned back. The wave cannot be stopped, only ridden. With a few exceptions, conservative Christian political activists are as ineffective as white Russian exiles, drinking tea from samovars in their Paris drawing rooms, plotting the restoration of the monarchy. One wishes them well, but knows deep down that they are not the future. Americans cannot stand to contemplate defeat or to accept limits of any kind but American Christians are going to have to come to terms with the brute fact that we live in a culture, one in which our beliefs make increasingly little sense. We speak a language that the world more and more either cannot hear or finds offensive to its ears. Could it be that the best way to fight the flood is to stop fighting the flood? That is to quit piling up sandbags and to build an ark in which to shelter until the water recedes and we can put our feet on dry land again. Rather than wasting energy and resources fighting unwinnable political battles, we should instead work on building communities, institutions, and networks of resistance that can outwit, outlast, and eventually overcome the occupation. This that that paragraph right there is maybe kind of typifies the majority of what this book to me has been so far, where I'm like, okay, I I agree like 90% with what you're saying, but there's a very important 10% that you're missing that I think would turn that would angle this conversation in a slightly different way. Um, we'll get into that more. The reason that the I'm reading the first two, the, the introduction in this first chapter is because it lays the groundwork for the second chapter. But the goal here is to read the second chapter. That's where things um, get really interesting to me. Fear not, we have been in a place like this before. In the first centuries of Christianity, the early church survived and grew under Roman persecution and later after the collapse of the empire in the West. We Latter-day Christians must learn from their example, and particularly from the example of St. Benedict. One day near the turn of the sixth century, a young Roman named Benedict said goodbye to his hometown, Nursia, a rugged village pocketed away in central Italy's Sibylline mountain range. The son of Nursia's governor, Benedict, was on his way to Rome the place where promising young men seeking a place in the world went to complete their education. There was no longer the Rome, this was no longer the Rome of imperial glory, the memory of which remained after Constantine's conversion made the empire officially Christian. 
Nearly 70 years before Benedict was born, the Visigoths had sacked the Eternal City. The collapse of the city of Rome was a staggering blow to the morale of citizens across the once mighty empire. By that time, the empire was governed in the west from Rome, which had long been in decline, and in the east from Constantinople, which thrived. Yet Christians throughout the empire mourned because Rome's suffering forced them to confront a terrible fact, that the foundations of the world they and their ancestors had known were crumbling before their eyes. My voice sticks in my throat, and as I dictate, sobs choke my utterance, wrote St. Jerome in its aftermath. The city which had taken the whole world was itself taken. So great was the shock that Jerome's contemporary, St. Augustine, wrote his classic City of God, which explained the catastrophe in terms of God's mysterious will and refocused the minds of Christians on the imperishable heavenly kingdom. It's very interesting thinking about um, a saint, St. Jerome, being um, so um, emotionally stricken at the collapse of Rome. Because you think of Rome as, as being this to, the, to a Christian's perspective, it was a great persecutor. It was a, um, a hive of degeneracy and, and uh, you know, pagans and all that kind of thing. And yet to him, the collapse of the great city was, 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 was uh, I don't know, just was striking to him. It, it just uh, um, devastated him, which is, which is kind of an interesting perspective. Imagine today, you know, would it, if, I don't know, New York collapsed and, descended into, um, you know, was, was, was overthrown and, 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 uh, 90% of the population was, was driven out. And like, can you imagine someone mourning, uh, like a Christian saint mourning the collapse of, of New York? It's kind of an interesting thought. Also, I tweeted something the other day and I don't know how many people actually got it, but I said, uh, um, pronouncing, I have to, I have to highlight it. I can't say it cause it gives away the joke, but pronouncing this guy's name, this one here starts with a C, ends with a T-I-N-E. Um, like this guy's name starts with an A, ends in a T-I-N-E. And uh, I, it's one of those jokes that just kind of maybe doesn't work on paper quite as much. I, I just don't tell very good jokes. But uh, most people say Constantine and Augustine, um, or they'll say Constantine and Augustine. And so it was funny to me is thinking about saying, um, uh, saying, uh, Let's see, Augustine and Const, um, Constantin. I was saying Constantin, and, and just thought it's funny that we pronounce this Augustine or Augustine, but nobody questions how to pronounce Constantine. Everyone just says Constantine. Funny little grammar points. Anyways, the city of Rome did not disappear, but by the time young Benedict arrived, Rome was a pathetic shadow of its former self. Once the world's largest city, with a population estimated at one million souls at the height of its power in the second century, its population plummeted in the decades after the sack. In 476, barbarians deposed the last Roman emperor of the West. By the turn of the 6th century, Rome's population had scattered, leaving only 100,000 souls to pick over the ruins. The overthrow of the Western Empire did not mean anarchy. To the contrary, in Italy, things went on much as they had gone for decades. Theodoric, the Visigoth king who ruled Italy in Benedict's time from his capital in Ravenna, was a heretical Christian, an Arian, but made a pilgrimage to Rome in the year 500 to pay his respects to the Pope. The king assured the Romans of his favor for them and his protection. In fact, the best he could do was to manage Rome's decline. We know few particulars of social life in barbarian-ruled Rome, but history shows that a great loosening of morals follows the shattering of a long-standing social order. Think of the decadence of Paris and Berlin after World War I, or of Russia in the decade after the end of the Soviet Empire. Pope St. Gregory the Great never knew Benedict, but he wrote the saint's biography based on interviews he conducted with four of Benedict's disciples. Gregory writes that young Benedict was so shocked and disgusted by the vice and corruption in the city that he turned his back on the life of privilege that awaited him there as the son of a government official. He moved to the nearby forest and later to a cave 40 miles to the east. There, Benedict lived a life of prayer and contemplation as a hermit for three years. This was normal in the first centuries of the church, and it continues in some places even today. In the third century, men, and even a few women, retreated to the Egyptian desert, renouncing all bodily comfort to seek God in a solitary life of silence, prayer, and fasting. They took to an extreme the scriptural injunction to die to self to live in Christ, obeying the Lord's command to the rich young ruler to sell his possessions, give to the poor, and follow him. St. Anthony of Egypt, circa 251 to 356, is believed to have been the first hermit. His followers founded com communal Christian monasticism, but the figure of the hermit remained a part of the monastic life and practice. During Benedict's three years in the cave, a monk named Romanus from a nearby monastery brought him food. 
By the time Benedict emerged from the cave, he had a reputation for sanctity and was invited by the monastic community to be their abbot. Eventually, Benedict founded 12 monasteries of his own in the region. His twin sister Scholastica, following in his footsteps, began her own community of nuns. To guide the monks and nuns in living simple, orderly lives consecrated to Christ, Benedict wrote a slim book now known as the Rule of St. Benedict. For the early monastics, a rule was simply a guide to living in Christian community. The one Benedict wrote is a more relaxed form of a very strict earlier one from the Christian East. In his rule, Benedict described the monastery as a school for the Lord's service. In that sense, his rule is simply a training manual. Modern readers who turn to it looking for mystical teaching of fathomless spiritual depth will be disappointed. Benedict's spirituality is wholly practical, and he originally wrote it not for the clergy, but for laymen. When he left fallen Rome for the wilderness, Benedict had no idea that his founding of his schools for the Lord's service would over time have such dramatic impact on Western civilization. Europe in the early Middle Ages was reeling from the calamitous end of the empire, which left in its wake countless local wars as barbarian tribes fought for dominance. Rome's fall left behind a staggering degree of material poverty, the result of both the disintegration of Rome's complex trade network and the loss of intellectual and technical sophistication. In these miserable conditions, the church was often the strongest and perhaps the only government people had. Within the broad embrace of the church, monasticism provided much needed help and hope to the peasantry. And thanks to Benedict, a renewed focus on spiritual life led many men and women to leave the world and devote themselves wholly to God within the walls of monasteries under the rule. These monasteries kept faith and learning alive within their walls, evangelized barbarian peoples and taught them how to pray, to read, to plant crops and to build things. Over the next few centuries, they prepared the devastated societies of post-Roman Europe for the rebirth of civilization. It all grew from the mustard seed of faith planted by a faithful young Italian who wanted nothing more than to seek and to serve God in a community of faith constructed to withstand the chaos and decadence all around them. Benedict's example gives us hope today because it reveals what a small cohort of believers who respond creatively to the challenges of their own time and place can accomplish by channeling the grace that flows through them from the radical openness to God and embodying that grace in a distinct way of life. In his book, After Virtue, philosopher Alistair McIntyre likened the present cultural moment to the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. He argued that the West has abandoned reason and the traditions of the virtues in giving itself over to the relativism that is now flooding our world, world today. We are, not we are governed not by faith or by reason or by any combination of the two. We are governed by what McIntyre called emotivism, the idea that all moral choices are nothing more than expressions of what the choosing individual feels is right. McIntyre said that a society that governed itself according to emotivist principles would look a lot like the modern West, in which the liberation of the individual's will is thought to be the greatest good. A virtuous society, by contrast, is one that shares belief in objective moral goods and the practices necessary for human beings to embody those goods in community. To live after virtue, then, is to dwell in a society that can not only that not only can no longer agree on what constitutes virtuous belief and conduct, but also doubts that virtue exists. In a post-virtue society, individuals hold maximum freedom of thought and action, and society itself becomes, quote, a collection of strangers, each pursuing his or her own interests under minim minimal constraints. This is like, this is describing what the uh, libertarian theory holds as the ideal. This is, this is like, as, a, as an ANCAP, trying to reach the most pure ANCAP society, this is functionally what I was visualizing. It's madness. Achieving this kind of society requires abandoning objective moral standards, refusing to accept any religiously or culturally binding narrative originating outside oneself, except as chosen, repudiating memory of the past as irrelevant, and distancing oneself from community as well as any unchosen social obligations. Voluntary, vo voluntarism, distancing oneself from community as well as any unchosen social obligations. Distancing yourself from un unchosen social obligations is quite literally what voluntarism is striving for, which is the antithesis of community. This state of mind approximates the condition known as barbarism. When we think of barbarians, we imagine wild, rapacious tribesmen rampaging through cities, heedlessly destroying the structures and institutions of civilization, simply because they can. Barbarians are governed only by their will to power, and neither know nor care a thing about what they are annihilating. 
by that standard, despite our wealth and technological sophistication, or you might say because of our wealth and technological sophistication, we in the modern West are living under barbarism, though we do not recognize it. Our scientists, our judges, our princes, our scholars, and our scribes, they are at work demolishing the faith, the family, gender, even what it means to be human. Our, barbar our, our barbarians have exchanged the animal pelts and spears of the past for designer suits and smartphones. McIntyre concluded after virtue by looking back to the West after barbarian tribes overthrew the Roman imperial order. He wrote, A crucial turning point in that earlier history occurred when men and women of goodwill turned aside from the task of shoring up the Roman imperium and ceased to identify the continuation of civility and moral community with the maintenance of that imperium. What they set themselves to achieve instead, often not recognizing fully what they were doing, was the construction of new forms of community within which the moral life could be sustained so that both morality and civility might survive the coming ages of barbarism and darkness. Let me read that one more time. A crucial turning point in that earlier history occurred when men and women of goodwill turned aside from the task of shoring up the Roman Imperium and ceased to identify the continuation of civility and moral community with the maintenance of that imperium. What they set themselves to achieve instead, often not recognizing fully what they were doing, was the construction of new forms of community within which the moral life could be sustained so that both morality and civility might survive the coming ages of barbarism and darkness. In McIntyre's reading, the post-Roman system was too far gone to be saved. St. Benedict had taken the proper measure of Rome. He acted wisely by leaving society and starting a new community whose practices would preserve the faith through the trials ahead. Though not then a Christian, McIntyre called on traditionalists who still believe in reason and virtue to form communities within which the life of virtue can survive the long dark age to come. The world, said McIntyre, awaits another, doubtless very different, St. Benedict. Christians besieged by the raging floodwaters of modernity await someone like Benedict to build arcs capable of carrying them and the living faith across the sea of crisis, a dark age that could last centuries. In this book, you will meet men and women who are today's Benedicts. Some live in the countryside, others live in the city. Still others make their homes in the suburbs. All of them are faithful Orthodox Christians. That is, theological conservatives within the three main branches of historic Christianity who know that if believers don't come out of Babylon and be separate, sometimes metaphorically, sometimes literally, their faith will not survive for another generation or two in this culture of death. They recognize an unpopular truth. Politics will not save us. Instead of, to look, instead of looking to prop up the current order, they have recognized that the kingdom of which they are citizens is not of this world and have decided not to compromise that citizenship. Again, this, to me, there's a... Um, there's kind of a false choice that he's setting up here, that politics and religion are something that stand in opposition to one another, and that um, by um, acting politically in any sense, you're compromising your religious principles. There's th th We don't fully agree on everything here, but just bear with it for now. What these Orthodox Christians are doing now are the seeds of what I call the Benedict Option, a strategy that draws on the authority of Scripture and the wisdom of the ancient church to embrace exile in place and form a vibrant counterculture. Recognizing the toxins of modern secularism, as well as the fragmentation caused by relativism, Benedict Option Christians look to scripture and to Benedict's rule for ways to cultivate practices and communities. See, I don't think that what he's describing here is apolitical. That's, I think that's probably the easiest way to say it. I don't think the Benedict Option is apolitical. He's setting it up as apolitical, but it doesn't need to be. Rather than panicking and remaining complacent, they recognize that the new order is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be lived with. It will be those who learn how to endure with faith and creativity to deepen their own prayer lives and adopting practices, focusing on families and communities instead of on partisan politics, and building churches, schools, and other institutions within which the Orthodox Christian faith can survive and prosper through the flood. This is not just about our own survival. If we are going to be free for the world as Christ meant for us to be, we are going to have to spend more time away from the world in deep prayer and substantial spiritual training just as Jesus retreated to the desert to pray before ministering to the people. We cannot give the world what we do not have. If the ancient Hebrews had been assimilated by the culture of Babylon, it would have ceased being a light to the world. So it is with the church. The reality of our situation is indeed alarming, but we do not have the luxury of doom and gloom hysteria. There is a hidden blessing in this crisis, if we all open our eyes to it. Just as God used chastisement in the Old Testament to call his people back to himself, so he may be delivering a like judgment onto a church and a people grown cold from selfishness, hedonism, and materialism. 
the coming storm may be the means through which God delivers us. Growing up in South Louisiana, whenever a hurricane was coming, somebody would take out the cast iron kettle, make a big pot of gumbo, and after battening down the hatches, invite the neighbors over to eat, tell stories, make merry, and ride out the storm together. This spirit ruled the response to the Great Flood of 2016. Even as the waters rose, little platoons all over South Louisiana rushed out to rescue the trapped, shelter the homeless, feed the hungry, with mountains of jambalaya mostly, and, com and comfort the broken and, and brokenhearted. This was not a response ordered from on high. It emerged spontaneously out of the love local people had for their neighbor and the sense of responsibility they had to care for those left poor and naked by the flood. Men and women of virtue, the Cajun Navy, church folks, and others do not wait to be told what to do. They recognize the seriousness of the crisis, and they moved. The grave spiritual and cultural crisis that has overtaken us did not come from nowhere. Though its pace has quickened over the past 50 years, the crisis has been gestating for many centuries. If we're going to figure out how to make it through the storm and the fog to safe harbor, we have to understand how we got here. Ideas, as we will see, have consequences. All right, so I'm going to pause here for just a moment before going on to kind of rest my voice, take a drink of water, catch up on the comments. What are your guys' thoughts so far? Andrew, of course, feels obligated to point out the differences between the Catholics and the Orthodox in their perceptions. Yes, we're aware that that Orthodox people view the world one way and that Catholic people view the world a different way. That's why Orthodox people are Orthodox and Catholic people are Catholic. <laughs> uh, what's up, Adam Patrick? Andrew really got to you, huh? In what sense? I don't know how Andrew got to me. Andrew has gotten to me in many different ways. I don't know exactly what you are referring to. Uh, let's see. Okay. You guys got quiet. Um, so the, as we, as we transitioned into this next chapter, I was, as I was listening to this, I was kind of like, okay, you know, this, this is, this seems pretty good. And, you know, I've got some quibbles with some of the stuff he says, and I've kind of touched on that already. Basically that I, I don't see um what he is setting up as in opposition to um being politically active in certain ways like the Mises Mayor's pack with Buck Johnson Th that kind of thing to me is not this isn't um trying to shore up the American Imperium or trying to um this isn't about trying to save the empire or anything like that this is doing we don't need to think about the political sphere and the rest of society or religious sphere as like separate um, domains. These are the, this is the same. It's all one domain. So being active politically in and of itself does not, is not at in a zero sum relationship with your religious experience. It should be an expression of it. It should be um, uh, a coherent part of it. And the the idea that these are separate domains, that there's the religious and the secular, this is actually, ironically, a little bit, the thing that he's kind of, I don't know, subconsciously appealing to here is, ironically, something that is born out of the process that we're about to read about, the, the um, trajectory of... Um, the 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 development or the evolution of um the reigning ideology of the day it's all rooted at all you can trace the line all the way back and that's what i was kind of doing the slow and hard way and he just he just whoosh, just buzzes through it in a, in a single chapter coming up here uh andrew says that book leftism by um evkl uh evkl which is um eric von Kano Ledeen, I think is how you pronounce his name, makes that point at length, and it's impossible to miss once you see it. And Caps are recreating the her Hermetic pre-Benedictine tradition. All right, let's continue. The Roots of the Crisis. On a warm evening in the late autumn, a recently retired woman sits on the front porch of her neighbor's house, talking about the ways of the world. It is two weeks before the Trump-Clinton election, and everything seems to be going to pieces, the neighbors agree. 
How did our country get to this place, they wonder. Both of the women are working class by culture, but thanks to the economic and cultural changes in the mid-20th century, they are now entering their golden years as members of a modest middle class. America has been very good to them and their families. Yet neither woman is confident about the future for their grandchildren. One tells the other that in the past year, she has gone to six baby showers for young women in her family and social circles. None of the expectant mothers had husbands. Some had more than one child out of wedlock. The gray-haired women know what poverty and insecurity are like, and they can't believe that these young women would bring children into the world without fathers in the home, given how much more likely children in those situations are to be poor. And where are the fathers, anyway? What's wrong with young men these days? These women are pro-life Christian conservatives who would never countenance abortion. They would rather see babies born than exterminated in the womb, no matter what the cost. Still, the normalization of having children outside of marriage is hard for them to take. In the 1940s, when they were born, the out-of-wedlock birth rate among whites was 2%. It is now nearly 30%. But the overall birth rate to unwed, mother unwed mothers is 41%. It's like the whole world is coming apart, sighed one of the women. I'm glad I'm not going to be around to see it, said the other. These women aren't imagining things. Their whole world really is unraveling. Political scientist Charles Murray documented, documented it in his aptly titled 2012 book, Coming Apart, the State of White America, 1960 to 2010. Murray focused his study on the white working class, but the social and cultural trends that have undone them are not confined to whites alone. Nor were the 1960s the beginning of our unraveling, though they were a turning point. We are living with the consequences of ideas accepted many generations ago. And as a result of those decisions, we are losing our religion, a far greater crisis than merely losing the habit of church going. The word religion comes from the Latin word religare, meaning to bind. From a sociological point of view, religion is a coherent system of beliefs and practices through which the community of believers know who they are and what they are to do. These beliefs and practices are held to be rooted in and expressive of the sacred order, both grounding and transcending existence. They tell and enact the story that holds the community together. The loss, excuse me, the loss of the Christian religion is why the West has been fragmenting for some time now, a process that is accelerating. How did that happen? There were five landmark events over seven centuries that rocked Western civilization and stripped it of its ancestral faith. In the 14th century, the loss of belief in the integral connection between God and creation, or in philosophic terms, transcendent reality, material reality. The collapse of religious unity and religious authority in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. The 18th century enlightenment, which displaced the Christian religion with the cult of reason, privatized religious life and, and inaugurated the age of democracy. The industrial revolution, circa 1760 to 1840, and the growth of capitalism in the 19th and 20th centuries, and the sexual revolution, 1960 to present. This outline of Western cultural history since the high Middle Ages admittedly leaves out a great deal, and it is biased toward an intellectual understanding of historical causation. In truth, material consequences often give birth to ideas. The discovery of the new world and the invention of the printing press, both in the 15th century, and the invention of the birth control pill on the internet in the 20th, made it possible for people to imagine things they never had before, and thus to think new thoughts. History gives us no clean, straight, causal lines binding events and giving them clear order. History is a poem, not a syllogism. Another great line. That said, outlining the role ideas, especially ideas about God, played in historical change gives us a conceptual understanding of the nature of our present crisis. It's important to grasp this picture, however incomplete and oversimplified, to understand why the humble Benedictine way is such a powerful counterforce to the dissolving currents of modernity. The people of the Middle Ages lived in what philosopher Charles Taylor calls an enchanted world, one so unlike ours that we struggle to imagine it. We in the modern West are on a distant shore, and the worldview of our medieval ancestors is over the horizon far from view. Medievals experience the divine as far more present in their daily lives. As it has been for most people, Christian and otherwise throughout history, religion was everywhere. And, this is crucial, crucial as a matter not merely of belief, but of experience. In the mind of medieval Christendom, the, spiritual, the spirit world and the material world penetrated each other. The division between them was thin and porous. Another way to put this is that the medievals experienced everything in the world sacramentally. We associate that word with church, and rightly so. 
Baptism is a sacrament, for example, as is communion. These are special rituals in which God's grace is present in a particular way, affecting a real transformation on those participating in it. But sacramentalism had a much broader and deeper meaning in the mind of the Middle Ages. People of those days took all things that existed, even time, as in some sense, sacramental. That is, they believed that God was present everywhere and revealed himself to us through people, places, and things through which his power flowed. The power of sacred places and the relics of saints had such potency to the medievals because God wasn't present in a vague spiritual sense, like a butler watching silently over a manor house. He was there, writes Taylor, as immediate reality, like stones, rivers, and mountains. The specific sense in which he was present was a mystery and a source of speculation and contention even back then. But that he was truly present was not disputed. The only reason the material world had any meaning at all was because of its relationship to God. Medieval man held that reality, what was really real, was outside himself, and that dwelling in the darkness of the fall, he could not fully perceive it. But he could relate to it intellectually through faith and reason, and know it through conversion of the heart. The entire universe was woven into God's own being in ways that are difficult for modern people, even believing Christians, to grasp. Christians of the Middle Ages took Paul's words recorded in Acts, in him we live and move and have our being, and in his letter to the Colossians, he is before all things and in him all things hold together, in a much more literal sense than we do. Medieval man did not see himself as fundamentally separate from the natural order. Rather, the alienation he felt was an effect of the fall, a catastrophe that, as he understood it, made it difficult for humans to see creation as it really is. His task was to join himself to the love of God and harmonize his own steps with the great cosmic dance. Truth was guaranteed by the existence of God, whose logos, the divine principle of order, was made fully manifest in Jesus Christ, but is present to some degree in all creation. Medieval Europe was no Christian utopia. The church was spectacularly corrupt, and the violent exercise of power, at times by the church itself, seemed to rule the world. Yet, despite the radical brokenness of their world, medievals carried within their imagination a powerful vision of integration. In the medieval consensus, men construed reality in a way that empowered them to harmonize everything conceptually and find meaning amid the chaos. The medieval conception of reality is an old idea, one that predates Christianity. In his final book, The Discarded Image, C.S. Lewis, who is a professional medievalist, explained that Plato believed that two things could relate to each other only through a third thing. In what Lewis called the medieval model, everything that existed was related to every other thing that existed through their shared relationship to God. Our relationship to the world is mediated through God, and our relationship to God is mediated through the world. Humankind dwelled not in a cold, meaningless universe, but in a cosmos in which everything had meaning because it participated in the life of the creator. Says Lewis, every particular fact and story became more interesting and more pleasurable if, by being properly fitted in, it carried one's mind back to the model as a whole. For the medievals, says Lewis, regarding the cosmos was like looking at a great building, perhaps like the Chartres Cathedral, overwhelming in its greatness, but satisfying in its harmony. The medieval model held all of creation to be bound in a complex unity that encompassed all of time and space. It reached its apogee in the highly complex rationalistic theology known as scholasticism, of which the brilliant 13th century Dominican friar Thomas Aquinas, 1225 to 1274, was the greatest exponent. Hold on here. I need to add a little bit more of this, uh, this Paloma Verde sports cream, cool menthol sports cream to my lower back now because I'm not feeling it in my upper back. Now I'm feeling it in my lower back. And I'm realizing I was feeling it in my lower back earlier, but I couldn't feel it. I wasn't noticing it because it was drowned out by what was going on in my upper back. But now I'll get a little bit of this down here. And I'm sure next I'm going to feel it in like my knees or something as it continues traveling down. And I continue applying the sports cream to chase it around my body. All right. Wipe my hands off here. So um, I know that the uh, the Orthodox in the in the crowd 
probably twitched a little bit when he mentioned Thomas Aquinas. And um, that, that was, was part of what I, I mentioned earlier, that the um, I noticed that as he's describing each of these um, trajectories, we'll call it, each of these adjustments in the trajectory, each each person along the way was sincere. They both, they all felt as they made these updates to the model of reality that they perceived, as they tried to refine it and tried to make it better, they all felt like that's what they were doing. They were sincerely um, sensed that they were pursuing Christ and that they were trying to um, glorify God in their understanding of him. However, for one reason or another, they were misled in that. And together, they, um, the accumulation of their philosophical tweaks created essentially the Antichrist. That's, that's kind of the biggest takeaway to kind of give away the plot. Um, and it, it came from a, an accumulation of successive people, each doing their best and sincerely pursuing God and yet missing him for a particular reason. And, um, therefore leading the next generation to build on their, it's like they, someone inserted a flaw into the foundation and then each successive generation built on top of that flawed foundation, but because they're building on a flawed foundation, their layer is flawed as well. And the more layers you get built up, the more flaws are baked in until eventually the system can't sustain all of the flaws. And what we're seeing now is the outworking of all these flaws baked in, but we'll continue. The core teachings of scholasticism include the principle that all things exist and have a God-given essential nature independent of human thought. This position is called metaphysical realism. From this principle comes what Charles Taylor identifies as the three basic bulwarks upholding the medieval Christian imaginary, that is, the vision of reality accepted by all Orthodox Christians from the early church through the high Middle Ages. The world and everything in it is part of a harmonious whole ordered by God and filled with meaning. And all things are signs pointing to God. Society is grounded in that higher reality. The world is charged with spiritual force. So those are the, those are the, what Charles Taylor identifies as the three basic bulwarks upholding the medieval Christian vision of reality accepted by all Orthodox Christians from the early church through the high middle ages. Once again, that the world and everything in it is part of a harmonious whole ordered by God and filled with meaning and all things are signs pointing to God. Number two, that society is grounded in that higher reality. And number three, the world is charged with spiritual force. These three pillars had to crumble before the modern world could arise from the rubble, Taylor says, and crumble they did. It did not happen at once, and it did not happen straightforwardly, but it happened. Theologian David Bentley Hart describes the transformation as opening, quote, an imaginative chasm between the pre-modern and modern worlds. Human beings now, in a sense, inhabited a universe different from that inhabited by their ancestors. Close quote. And this is which this is fascinating that human beings' perception of reality actually colors the reality that they live in. Like in, in, in a literal sense, you live in the reality you create for yourself. If you perceive reality as a certain way and you live in accordance with that, that is the reality that you live in. There's human consciousness is bound up with reality in such a way that there's a, there's a self-generating nature to it that, that people are kind of circling and trying to hone in on and trying to pick out, trying to understand. And it's like each person sees just a little bit, bit of the picture. And then they try to build the rest of it out from that individual piece that they saw. But you know, each, each person has a, a, a piece of the puzzle and it's a, it's like humanity is trying to put this puzzle together, but when it's missing certain pieces, it fills them in with things that shouldn't be there. And so it creates a broken puzzle and the puzzle cracks and falls apart and people have to pick the pieces back up again. The theologian who did the most to topple the mighty Oak of the medieval model, that is Christian metaphysical realism was a Franciscan from the British Isles, William of Ockham. 1285 to 1347. 
The axe he and his theological allies created to do the job was a big idea that came to be called nominalism. Realism holds that the essence of a thing is built into its existence by God, and its ultimate meaning is guaranteed by this connection to the transcendent order. This implies that creation is comprehensible because it is rationally ordered by God and a revelation of him. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork, says the psalmist. This is like, this was the, what, what led me into this philosophical and ultimately religious study was trying to understand this from the, you know, quote unquote, scientific perspective. I was, I mean, I was, I was trying to understand quantum mechanics and, uh, different levels of reality and, um, uh, like the, the mathematical, uh, implications of um you know of particle physics and and this type of stuff it's it's, it's completely outside my ability to comprehend but i was like grasping at it trying to figure it out because i wanted to understand the best of what quote unquote science capital s science had to offer about the world and what it was leading me toward is this that this is where the 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 sincere study of science is leading back to and the people doing it are doing everything they can to avoid this to get away from this and to try to keep it in purely secular um uh, completely uh, uh desacralized terms but they can't help it because it's a base fact of reality that creation is rationally ordered by god and a revelation of him God is not a separate thing out um, uh, that, that has, it's not like us, like I go and I build a sandcastle and then I step away from it and there's the sandcastle there and there's, and I'm here. And maybe you can learn something about me from the sandcastle. It's even more than that, that God's nature is literally expressed through nature. That is a, 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 a depiction of his nature. The sense that the material world discloses the workings of the transcendent order was present in ancient philosophy and in many world religions, even non-theistic ones like Taoism. Metaphysical realism tells us that the awe we feel in the presence of nature, beauty, or goodness, the feeling that there must be more than what we experience with our senses, is a reasonable intuition. It doesn't tell us who God is, but it tells us that we are not imagining things. Something, or someone, is there. Aquinas puts it like this. To know that someone is approaching is not the same as to know that Peter is approaching even though it is Peter who is approaching. Through prayer and contemplation, we may build on that intuition and come to know the identity of the one we sense. For example, the yearning for meaning and truth that all humans have, says David Bentley Hart, is simply a manifestation of the metaphysical structure of all reality. Reading that one more time. The yearning for meaning and truth that all humans have is simply a manifestation of the metaphysical structure of all reality. But if the infinite God reveals himself through finite matter, does that not imply limitation? Occam thought so. He denied metaphysical realism out of zeal to protect God's sovereignty. Again, he's framing this in like that the guy had the best of intentions, which is like, it's like a way of when you assume that other people have the best of intentions, which I'm not, I'm not great at. I struggle with this. But when you assume that other people have the best of intentions, it's like you're steel manning their position. Once it, when you accuse them of, of, um, of having ulterior motives, then you um, you're opening up an avenue for them to not take your um, interaction with them seriously. If you assume they have the best of intentions, then you steel man their position and you can learn more. It's more constructive. Um, Let's see. But if the infinite God reveals himself through finite matter, does that not imply limitation? Occam thought so. He denied metaphysical realism out of zeal to protect God's sovereignty. He feared that realism restricted God's freedom of action. For Occam, if something is good, it is because God desired it to be so. The meaning of all things derives from God's sovereign will. That is, not because of what he is, or because of his participation in their being, but because of what he commands. If he calls something good today and the same thing evil tomorrow, that is his right. Which, if he chose to do that, 
sure, but he wouldn't choose to do that. That's not a thing that will ever actually be. So using that as a determinative principle is is um, is only going to lead you into uh, away from reality because that is never reality. It's not reality that God will call something good today and then evil tomorrow. That's foreign to the nature of God. And something that is foreign to the nature of God cannot be part of reality. So making a decision based upon that premise will necessarily lead you away from reality, which will necessarily lead you away from God. This idea implies that objects have no intrinsic meaning, only the meaning assigned to them, and therefore no meaningful existence outside the mind. A table is just wood and nails arranged in a certain way until we give it meaning by naming it table. Nomen is the Latin word for name, hence nominalism. In Occam's thought, God is an all-powerful entity who is totally separate from creation. God has to be, taught Occam, or else his freedom to act would be bound by the laws he made. A truly omnipotent God cannot be restrained by anything in his view. If something is good, therefore, it is good because God said so. God's will, therefore, is more important than God's intellect. This sounds like angels dancing on the head of a pin stuff, but its importance cannot be overstated. Medieval metaphysicians believed nature pointed to God. Nominalists did not. They believed that there is no inner meaning existing objectively within nature and discoverable by reason. Meaning is extrinsic, that is, imposed from the outside by God and accessible to humans by faith in him and his revelation alone. If this sounds like plain good sense to you, then you begin to grasp how revolutionary nominalism was. What was once a radical theory would, in time, become the basis for the way most people understood the relationship between God and creation. It made the modern world possible. But as we will see, it also set the stage for man enthroning himself in the place of God. To go back up here, um, a truly omnipotent God cannot be restrained by anything in his view. This would, this is, the, the, what he's doing here is he's taking a pre-existing definition of omnipotence and then judging God according to that definition. But God is the definition of omnipotence. There isn't a pre-existing category of omnipotence that you staple onto God. God is omnipotence. There is no concept of omnipotence separate from God. So he created something that doesn't exist, a hypothetical concept of a truly omnipotent God. And then he took actual God and compared him to that. And he said, actual God doesn't relate to this made up um, conception of God. Therefore, I'm going to change my perception of actual God. So now I'm going to remake God in my own image. This is this is what Occam was doing. And I, and, and I sincerely believe he meant well. But this is how um, this is how these kinds of temptations work. Like the the devil didn't show up to Eve and say, we need to rebel against God. He showed up and he like he told her the truth. He said he gave her like a rationalization for something. And he's like, don't you want this very good thing? God even told you that you would have this very good thing. Don't you want it? He's very rational. And, and, and he appealed to her best nature. This is how temptation works. The devil doesn't present himself as a, a red guy with horns and a pitchfork. He presents himself as an angel of light who is encouraging you to pursue God even more sincerely and even more earnestly than you already did. He's offering you new knowledge. Here's new knowledge that you don't have that will help you in your pursuit of God. That new knowledge winds up being Promethean fire. That this is the this is the cycle. This is the cycle over and over again. Go listen to the last three episodes of Lord of Spirits. They did a series on the falls of humanity. We think of one single fall being like what's called the fall, capital F fall, which is Eden. But there's actually three different falls. There's Eden, there's the flood, and there's Babel. And if you read the church fathers, different ones of them, none of them denied any of the three of them, but different ones of them emphasized uh, different falls as the most significant fall. And um, my understanding, at least at this point, is that it was actually less common to see what we today call the fall as the fall. It was more common for it to be seen as either the flood or uh, the uh, or, or Babel. Those were seen as the real fall of humanity. Um, those are like the paradigmatic fall. And then these other falls were, um, were, were uh, like microcosms of the main fall. Anyways, 
Um, let me catch up on the comments here and see if this is um, okay. This is an interesting conversation, but I can't, I won't be able to hold this in my head and, and stick on track with the book with what I'm reading. So, uh, da, 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 da. okay. Um, let's get back to the reading here. Okay. Ideas don't occur in a vacuum. This is what I've tried to, this is the idea I've been trying to get across to people. You can't just evaluate an idea, um, as if it just manifested out of the ether and it just has its, its, its own standalone thing. You ideas are, cannot be understood apart from their history. You have to study the history of the idea. Where did the idea come from? That will give you, um, a full perspective of the idea. Otherwise you're just seeing a two dimensional, um, depiction of it and you're not seeing the depth that goes behind it that undergirds it uh, no phone call as c.s lewis put it we are all very properly familiar with the idea that in every age the human mind is deeply influenced by the accepted model of the universe but there is a two-way traffic the model is also influenced by the prevailing temper of mind close quote Nominalism emerged from a restless civilization whose people were questioning, were questing for something different. The Middle Ages were an age of intense faith and spirituality, but as even the art and poetry of the 14th century showed, humanity began turning its gaze away from the heavens and toward this world. After Occam, the so-called natural philosophers, thinkers who studied nature, the precursors of scientists, began to shed the metaphysical baggage bequeathed to them by Aristotle and his medieval Christian successors. They discovered that one didn't need to have a philosophical theory about a natural phenomenon's being in order to examine it empirically and draw conclusions. The problem with this here, my, my own words, the idea that you don't need to have a philosophical theory about a natural phenomenon's being in order to examine it empirically and draw conclusions is a philosophical theory about a natural phenomenon's being in order to examine it empirically and draw conclusions. That you, you can't get away from this, this meta, this, this self-reference here. Believing you don't need to have a physical, philosophical theory is itself a philosophical theory. So then that philosophical theory becomes an unexamined philosophical theory. It's something now that you're just holding a priori without actually um, considering the implications of it. Meanwhile, in the world of art and literature, a new emphasis on naturalism and individualism emerged. The old world, with its metaphysical certainties, its formal hierarchies, and its spiritual focus, gradually ceased to hold the imagination of Western man. Art became less symbolic, less, less, real, less idealized, less focused on religious themes, and more occupied with the life of man. The model shuddered under philosophical assault, but horrifying events outside the world of art and ideas also shook it to the core. War, especially the Hundred Years' War between France and England, racked Western Europe, which also suffered a catastrophe 14th century famine, a catastrophic 14th century famine. Worst of all was the Black Death, a plague that killed between one third and one half of all Europeans before burning itself out. Few civilizations could withstand all those kinds of traumas without tremendous upheavals. For all these reasons, the model broke apart. Metaphysical realism had been defeated. What emerged was a new individualism, a this-worldliness that would inaugurate the historical period called the Renaissance. The defeat of metaphysical realism inaugurated a new and dynamic phase of Western history, one that would culminate in a religious revolution. Renaissance and Reformation Renaissance is a French word meaning rebirth. It refers to the cultural efflorescence that accompanied the West rediscovery of the Greek and Roman roots of its civilization, which uh, rather interestingly happened right after Rome sacked Constantinople. Then suddenly they brought back all the, the riches and wealth and literature from Constantinople to Rome and whoop, Renaissance happened. Anyways, I just said that to, to uh, get under Andrew's skin. It is important to note that the term was not applied to the period bridging the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the modern era until the 19th century. It contains within it the secular progressive belief that the religiously focused medieval period was a time of intellectual and artistic sterility, a ludicrous judgment, but an influential one. Nevertheless, the Renaissance does mark a distinct change in European culture, which shifted its focus from the glory of God to the glory of man. We can become what we will, said Pico Dea Marandola, 1463 to 94, the archetypal Renaissance philosopher. It was not an open form of satanic defiance. Indeed, Pico uttered that famous line in an oration in which he cautioned against abusing God's gift of free will. But those words express the Renaissance's optimism 
about human nature and its possibilities. What was being reborn in the Renaissance? The, classic spirit of, the classical spirit of ancient Greece and Rome, which had gone into eclipse following the 5th century collapse of the Western Roman Empire and the subsequent advent of the Christian medieval period. While the late medieval period con concentrated on the rediscovery of Greek philosophical texts, Italian scholars of the 14th century led the way in reviving ancient literature and history. Man is the measure of all things, said the ancient Greek philosopher Protagoras, in a line that also described the spirit of the new age dawning upon Europe. Renaissance humanism began to cons consider the world through classical insights and emphasized the study of poetry, rhetoric, and other disciplines we now call humanities. Though, though humanist culture was not as narrowly focused on the faith as its medieval predecessor, it was by no means anti-Christian. The Renaissance brought into Western Christianity a greater concern for the individual, for freedom, and for the dignity of man as bearing the image of God. Medieval, I would say, it brought into it a greater concern relative to what was there previously, but not necessarily, um, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say it made it better in that sense. It just introduced something that hadn't been there before. Um, medieval Christianity focused on the fall of man, but the more humanistic Christianity of the Renaissance centered on man's potential. Christian humanism was far more individualistic than what came before it, and it sought to Christianize the classical model of the hero, the man of virtue. Scholasticism emphasized reason and intellect as the way to relate to God. Christian humanism focused on the will. The danger was that Christian humanists would become too enamored of human potential and man's capacity for self-creation and lose sight of his chronic inclination towards sin. This was a temptation to which the Italian humanists were particularly susceptible. They were all too pleased to cast off the sackcloth and ashes of medieval asceticism and revel in the glory and vigor of the sensual life. Not so with the humanists of Northern Europe, who were more modest in their piety and restrained in their optimism about human nature. They were more drawn to scripture than to philosophy and were concerned primarily with reforming the church toward a more rigorous morality and a more democratic religious life. They viewed with skepticism, even disdain, the sensuality that had overtaken European life, especially in the church. Renaissance Rome was a cesspit of vice, and the corruption reached far beyond the papal court and the Vatican walls. Many bishops were despised for their worldliness, while drunken and ignorant parish clergy, indifferent to the gospel, were disrespected by their angry flocks. As the church hemorrhaged spiritual and moral authority, the clamor for change rose. But the Renaissance popes, prisoners of their own greed and taste for opulence, refused to listen. They thought what they had would last forever. It took an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther to shatter their illusions, and with it, the religious unity of the West. The Reformation, as we call the revolution he started, was not the first protest movement against Catholic Church corruption, but it was the first to hack at the theological and ecclesiological, ecclesiological roots of Roman Catholicism itself. Luther built his revolution not only on protests against church corruption, but also on the theological and philosophical developments that had already occurred within Latin Christianity. In 1517, Luther proclaimed his 95 Theses, questioning the sale of indulgences, a feature of the Catholic penitential system that allowed the living to buy relief for relatives believed suffering punishment in purgatory. In fact, Luther aimed his formidable rhetorical canon or structure defining sin, forgiveness, and ecclesial authority. In 1520, the Vatican excommunicated Luther for refusing to recant his belief that scripture alone, as distinct from scripture and the authoritative interpretation of the Roman Church, was the source of Christian truth. Thus was the Protestant Reformation born. Though there was a great deal of local diversity across Catholic Europe, fidelity to the Roman Catholic institution and its authority to proclaim objective religious truth had been a unifying principle. The Reformation destroyed that unity and stripped those under its sway of many symbols, rituals, and concepts that had structured the inner lives of Christians. Reformation era Christians, Protestants, would no longer bow before what the reformers believed to be superstition and idolatry. Scripture was their only authority in religious matters. The question immediately arose, whose interpretation of scripture? Oop. No reformer believed in private interpretation of scripture, but they had no clear way to discern whose interpretation was the correct one. The reformers quickly discovered that casting off Rome's authority solved one problem, but created another. As historian Brad Gregory puts it, quote, because Christians disagreed about what they were to believe and do, they disagreed about what the fruits of a Christian life were. Reading that one more time. Because Christians disagreed about what they were to believe and do, they disagreed about what the fruits of a Christian life were. And so it remains to our day. Because religion was inseparable from politics and culture, the Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation quickly led to a series of savage wars that shredded Europe. It's interesting that he says here that religion was inseparable from politics and culture, yet 
today he talks like it like they are and there's no no justification for that religion today is inseparable from politics politics and culture that's a that's a feature of those things if religion is the thing that communities use to bind themselves if religion is to bind then the way that those communities govern themselves is going to be inherently religious you're not you can't separate those two things from each other and the culture is going to be the um what 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 mediates between those things the culture is going to be the way that the religion expresses itself in politics to be fair, the wars of religion were as political, social, and economic as they were religious. Of course they were, because those were all the same things. But the religious basis for the wars caused worry European intellectuals to explore ways of living peaceably with the schism between Rome and the reformers. The scientific, uh, oh, new title, The Dawn of the Enlightenment. Let me real quick run over here and retweet a couple of things. Just to do the whole social media thing, got to keep all this stuff in front of everybody else. Uh, hold on. Bear with me for a sec, guys. I'm going to retweet. And where's the other one here? Retweet. Okay. All right, back to the reading. Okay, the dawn of the Enlightenment. The scientific revolution indirectly suggested a possible way out. Even as the wars of religion raged, science made rapid advances. The scientific revolution was a roughly 200-year period of staggering advances in science and the mathematics that began with Copernicus, 1473 to 1543, who showed that the Earth was not the fixed center of creation, and ended with Newton, 1642 to 1727, whose breakthrough discoveries laid the foundation for modern physics. The era overturned the Aristotelian Christian cosmos, a hierarchical model of reality in which all things exist organically through their relationship to God, in favor of a mechanical universe ordered by laws of nature with no necessary grounding in the transcendent. Most leaders of the scientific revolution were professing Christians, but the revolution's grounding lay undeniably in nominalism. Here's where you can see how these ideas are building on top of each other. These ideas don't exist in a vacuum distinct from one another. They're continuing to, to build and, oh man, they're continuing to build and, uh, and grow and uh, be born out of one another. Um, I don't know how to go fast through here. So just bear with me as I click through. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, da, da. Ta -da. It's the first time I've ever used this app for this. Okay. Um, so so the most leaders of the scientific revolution were professing Christians. So again, these are Christians. These are Christians who are seeking to study and understand nature from the perspective of being Christians, but they're adopting some of the 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 ideas and presuppositions of their immediate forebearers who had done the same with their immediate forebearers. Who had done the same with their immediate forebears? Once you get deviated off down this track, then each successive person thinks that they're reaching out and pursuing God, but they're getting further and further away from Him. And what what God is to them is getting is is deviating further and further from who God actually is. And you can see that this is this is a a, a trajectory that's both inevitable and um, cannot last. It's going to reach a point where you it's going to reach a point where people will be worshiping the Antichrist, thinking they're worshiping Christ. That's the trajectory that we're on. If the material world could be studied and understood on its own without reference to God, then science can exist on its own free of theological controversy. This practical proposition allowed science to develop unhindered by metaphysical and religious suppositions. Again, the idea that science is unhindered by metaphysical and religious suppositions is a metaphysical and religious supposition. Science focused on facts about the material world that could be demonstrated, and it had an empirical method of testing hypotheses to prove or disprove their claims. And science worked in practical ways. Sir Francis Bacon, an important late Renaissance philosopher and founder of the scientific method, famously said that scientific discovery ought to be applied, quote, for the relief of man's estate. That is, 
to improve the lives of humans by reducing their pain, suffering, and poverty. Note that he said that he wrote earlier um, about how suffering is the language through which God speaks to us. So if science, if scientific discovery becomes an avenue for relieving man's pain, suffering, and poverty, then science is quite literally crowding God out because suffering is the language through which God speaks to us. Suffering is the way through which God saves us. So if you're using an alternate method to, to eliminate suffering from your life, a method that is not God, then not only are you replacing God in your life, but you're also replacing the capacity for God to speak to you in your life. You're shutting yourself off from him so that he, even if he wanted to, you've closed yourself off from him. Of course he wants to. And this is in ostensibly, again, steel manning the position. This is the goal is to improve the lives of humans by reducing their pain, suffering, and poverty. This sounds like a good thing. This is very noble. This sounds like a noble Christian impulse. This is, this is the Antichrist building himself up through the minds of ostensibly well-meaning Christians, which I would consider by being a child of the West, Bacon is effectively a Christian, even if he wouldn't have considered himself that. He's descended from Christians. He's operating in a worldview that's fundamentally rooted in Christianity. It's just deviating from it. This was a turning point in the history of ideas. The natural world was to be taken no longer as something to be contemplated as in any way an icon of the divine, but rather as something to be understood and manipulated by the will of humankind for its own sake. In this way, the scientific revolution further distanced God from creation in the minds of men. The scientific revolution culminated in the life and work of Sir Isaac Newton, a physicist, mathematician, and unorthodox Christian who fabricated a new model of the universe that explained its physical workings in a wholly mechanical way. Newton certainly believed that the laws of motion he discovered had been established by God. Yet Newton's God, in contrast to the God of traditional Christian metaphysics, was like a divine watchmaker who fashioned a timepiece, wound it, and let it carry on without his further involvement. The explosion of science changed Western epistemology, the study of how we know what we know. Aristotelian science, which dominated the Middle Ages, was based on metaphysical concepts about the essential nature of things. The new, sci the new science jettisoned the metaphysical baggage and reasoned from empirical observations alone. Philosopher and mathematician René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, would change the approach to the epistemological question even further. Whereas Bacon said that we should develop models by reasoning from empirical observation, Descartes took a more purely rationalistic approach. Descartes taught that the best method was to begin by accepting as true only clear ideas that were beyond doubt. You should accept nothing as truth on the basis of authority, and you should even doubt your senses. Only those things of which you can be certain are true. And the first principle of all under this method is, I think, therefore, I am. That is, the only thing that cannot be doubted is one's own existence. That is the foundation of all other thought, according to Descartes, who in this way made the autonomous thinking individual into the determiner of truth. Descartes was a rationalist, but not a moral relativist. Indeed, he considered himself a faithful Catholic whose mission in part was to reconcile science to faith. And I think this should be very clear. He's going to go into it a little bit more here, but I think it should be very clear the just the incoherence of this. You should accept nothing as truth on the basis of authority, and you should even doubt your senses, except for the senses that tell you that um, that you think, therefore you are. Like that's a sense. That itself is a sense. Like I think, therefore I am. This isn't. This isn't. This isn't. This is a complete logical non sequitur. I think, therefore I am. It's like some thoughts happened, and I was aware of them. But like that. To, 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 to create a fundamental axiom out of this is just completely incoherent. And uh, you can also see the subversive nature of this. You should accept nothing as truth on the basis of authority. Like that right, it, right there, that right there, there's the spirit of the serpent in the garden. You should accept nothing as truth on the basis of authority. Don't, don't even accept your own senses. Just believe in yourself. All that matters is yourself. You are the arbiter of truth. This is like 
the summation of the deconstruction of Christianity. What Descartes did, and of course, and it came from someone who considered himself a faithful Catholic, again, is well-meaning. The guy's not trying to be the destructor of Christianity, but that's how he winds up being. This is the danger of deviating from the truth and relying on one's own self, ironically. What Descartes did, and what makes him the father of modern philosophy, was to invert the medieval approach to knowledge. To the scholastics, reality was an objective state, and humankind's role was first to understand the metaphysical nature of reality. Only then could humans begin to explore knowledge of the world and everything within it. Descartes, on the other hand, began all inquiry with radical subjectivity, declaring that the first principle of knowledge was that the self is conscious of itself. Descartes' philosophy opened the door to the world-changing project dubbed the Enlightenment by its cheerleaders, eager to contrast it to the supposedly dark days when revealed religion had its death grip on the Western mind. At its core, the Enlightenment was an attempt by European intellectuals to find a common basis outside religion for determining moral truth. The success of science led moral philosophers to explore how disinterested reason, which was so successful in the realm of science, could show the West a non-sectarian way to live. So the it, it gets disinterested reason gets its toe in the door through science, and now and and it completely undergirds the foundations of people's um, metaphysical reality, and then it turns itself back on the church. The philosophers of the Enlightenment ought to use reason alone to establish a new basis for political and social life, one that was separated from the past. They tried to create a secular morality that any reasonable person could understand and affirm, and they believed that this was possible. But you could see that you can see the, like the 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 um the noble notion in here. You know, we should just create like create Christianity where we could sell Christianity to someone without them realizing that it's Christianity, and then eventually they realize that they've been a Christian all along, and then they'll just become a Christian. You know, like libertarianism and Christianity are compatible. You know, libertarianism is just the secular version of Christianity. So we'll get people into that, and then then they'll realize that they're actually Christians. We just need to get people to act like Christians, but we don't need to 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 actually sell Christianity to them because they would reject it if they saw it. They also advocated science and technology as a way to impose man's rational will upon nature, and they extolled the freely choosing individual. What's interesting is this 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 misunderstanding of what free will is. Free will is not, especially as would have been understood by the medievals, free will is not the function of humans choosing itself. V will and volition are not the same thing. A, the will of a thing is um, the, the desire or the, the impulse, the motivation within that thing to become the truest expression of itself to it's like it's a it's like destiny will is like your, your the, the destiny of your thing so the the will of an acorn is to become an oak tree the the will of an acorn is not to do whatever it wants that's not free will free will is not the um uh the unhinging of human volition and allowing a human to choose whatever they want. You don't have free will to choose vice. To free your will is to set your um to set you free to pursue truth, to orient yourself toward your human destiny, which is theosis, which is to become God. God became man so that man might become God. Saint Athanasius. Again, Last three episodes of Lord of Spirits breaks all this stuff down. Um, <laughs> trying to sneak Christianity in the back door via libertarianism just goes to show that the latter is fundamentally subversive. Nailed it. Good job, Cooper. I'll give you a pat on the back. Uh, okay. For our purposes, the Enlightenment matters because it was the decisive break with the Christian legacy of the West. God, if he was mentioned at all, was not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the nondescript divinity of the deists. Deism, a rationalistic school of thought that emerged in the Enlightenment, holds that God is a cosmic architect who created the universe but does not interact with it. It removes the person of God, essentially. Deism rejects biblical religion and the supernatural and bases its principles on what can be known about God, the supreme being, through reason alone. Most of the American founding fathers were either confessed deists, like Benjamin Franklin, also a Freemason, 
or strongly influenced by deism. For example, Thomas Jefferson. Deism was a powerful intellectual force in 18th century American life. John Locke, the English pol political philosopher whose teaching was a great influence on the American founding, was technically not a deist. His belief in miracles contradicted the deist's watchmaker, watchmaker god, but his philosophy was strongly consonant with deist principles. Locke believed that the autonomous individual, born as a blank slate with no innate nature, is the fundamental unit of society. The purpose of the government, according to Locke, is not to pursue virtue, but rather to establish and guard a social order under which individuals can exercise their will within reason. Government exists to secure the rights of these individuals to life, liberty, and property. The authors of the Declaration of Independence changed this formulation to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, a phrase every American school child learns in his civic catechism. The U.S. Constitution, a Lockean document, privatizes religion, separating it from the state. Every American school child learns to consider this a blessing, and perhaps it is, but segregating the sacred from the secular in this way profoundly shaped the American religious consciousness. Separating the, the sacred from the secular just ensures that the secular has no contact to the sacred. That's not a, that's not a merit. That's not a virtue. It's not a virtue to have a secular state. That means the state will not be, um, uh, will not be affected by the church. You don't, you don't want that. You don't want the state to be a secular atheistic institution unless you want to wind up with secular atheistic outcomes, which are not good outcomes. For all the good that religious tolerance undoubtedly brought to a young country with a diverse and contentious population of Protestant sectarians and a Catholic minority, again, he's, he's, doing, uh, he, he's assuming the best of everybody. He's, he's assuming each person is, um, uh, has the best of intentions. He's steel manning their position. It also laid the groundwork for excluding religion from the public square by making it a matter of private individual choice. Let me read that again. I stopped in the middle of the sentence. For all the good that religious tolerance undoubtedly brought to a young country with a diverse and contentious population of Protestant sectarians and a Catholic minority, it also laid the groundwork for excluding religion from the public square by making it a matter of private individual choice. In the American order, the state's role is simply to act as a referee among individuals and factions. The government has no ultimate conception of the good, and it regards its own role as limited to protecting the rights of individuals. When a society is thoroughly Christian, this is an ingenious way to keep the peace and allow for general flourishing. But from the Christian point of view, enlightenment liberalism contained the seeds of Christianity's undoing. So this is where it's not, it's actually, it's not really an ingenious way to keep the peace and allow for general flourishing because it is the thing that undoes Christianity. So if your society is thoroughly Christian and you want your society to, in the future, no longer be thoroughly Christian, then instantiate this form of government with religious tolerance, meaning that the public square has to be atheistic and religion is a private matter for everyone to keep to themselves. It's inevitable that we're going to, you're going to arrive where we've arrived. In a letter to soldiers in 1798, John Adams, a founding father and practicing Unitarian, remarked, we had no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution was made only for, for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And I'd go on to say that the constitution was made for the undoing of a moral and religious people, even if the people who made it didn't mean it that way. Adams understood that liberty under the constitution could only work if the people were virtuous, restraining their passions and directing them toward the good, as defined, presumably, by Adams' rationalist religious belief. Fortunately, having gone through the first great awakening of the mid-18th century, America was strongly evangelical, and citizens had a strong shared idea of the good and shared definition of virtue. Unfortunately, this would not last. If it was to last, then it would require for that great awakening to have changed the... You, you, you can't just say, okay, we had the Great Awakening, so um, now that everybody's moral and religious, then we need to um, institute an atheistic secular state to ensure that, um, that everyone stays that way or something like that. Because having an atheistic secular state just means that you've created the most powerful institution imaginable that could be taken over by atheist secularists 
who will then begin to distort and pervert the society and undermine undermine the that strong shared idea of the good and shared definition of virtue because that's the, 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 that's the function of the state. The state will do that if that door is left open to it. Democracy, capitalism, romanticism, the calamitous 19th century. In the middle of the 18th century, new technological breakthroughs began to give man unprecedented power over nature. This led to an explosion in manufacturing and commerce, which brought revolutionary changes to society. The socially stable way of life based on farming and crafts came to an end. Peasants moved en masse to cities, where they became workers in the new factories. The social hierarchies of the traditional family and village began to dissolve. The same was true in politics. The American Revolution in 1776 overthrew monarchy and established a constitutional republic. The far bloodier French Revolution of 1789 was much more radical, attempting near totalitarian refashioning of French society in the name of republicanism. Its terror ended in the dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte, who restored order, but the violence unleashed by the revolution and its ideals rocked Europe for the rest of the century. It shook monarchies and established orders, using the ideals of liberty and democracy to batter old, older authoritarian structures. Around the same time, artists and intellectuals began to rebel against Enlightenment reason and the effects of the Industrial Revolution. The Romantics, as they were called, found many aspects of the new rationalist mechanized society distasteful, but had no interest in returning to the Christian world. They prized emotion, individuality, nature. They, they prized emotion, individuality, nature, and personal freedom. So you see the Romantics here are a, uh, a reaction to the, the rationalists, which were a reaction to and built upon the, the, uh, the nominalists. Um, or it, so like each of these was built on top of each one was built successfully on top of the other. They're, 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 it's this right, left step throughout history. Um, not necessarily right, left in the political sense though that traces with it, but it's, you don't get the romantics without first having the rationalists and you don't get the rationalists without having the Renaissance and you don't get the Renaissance without having nominalism. You don't, each of these things was, was built on and was a, um, the source of or produced the next thing. And this, this trend continues. We aren't at the end of history. We're merely in one part. What we're seeing is a transition era now from one thing back to another thing. But that, that, that other thing is not going to be going back. It's going to be going forward and it's going to be a reaction to the existing thing. <clears throat> They advocated an ideal, this is the romantics, they advocated an ideal of the heroic creative individual, one who rejects the strictures of society, one who follows his feelings and intuitions. For the romantics, meaning and release from the ugliness of modern society was to be found in art, nature, and culture. Theirs was a primitivist reaction against the cold rationalism of the preceding age. Though a man of the Enlightenment era, philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, became the father of romanticism. Rousseau advanced the idea that man is born naturally good, but is corrupted by society. From Rousseau came the modern notion that the freer a society is, the more virtuous it is. The people, in expressing the general will, are always right. Alexis de Tocqueville, a fr young French aristocrat traveling through America in 1831 to 32, observed Rousseau's egalitarian ideals in practice. In Democracy in America, Tocqueville concluded that democracy was the future of Europe, but observed that with its drive for equality, which entailed making standards relative to the majority's will, democracy risked eliminating the virtues that made self-rule possible. Democracies will succeed only if mediating institutions, including the churches, thrive. In the 19th century, intellectual elites understood that the world around them was quickly fragmenting. All that is solid melts into air, said Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto, 1848, which accurately observed that the Industrial Revolution had destroyed old certainties. Writing a generation after Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species in 1859, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche understood natural selection to mean that there is no divine plan guiding man's development. It is random, based on the survival of the fittest. Nietzsche drew on Darwin to formulate a philosophy extolling strength in the individual will. Notice, how, notice the dates here as these things have progressed. It's gone from each new development lasting centuries to each new development lasting decades. 
and what we've gotten now is what was the the was it Lenin who said um there are some years um like in, in some years decades happen and some decades I, I can't remember the exact phrase but um basically it's like in in um certain periods of time you have a whole big jump of progress or of, of advancement or whatever and then in other periods of time you go a really long time where very short uh or very small amounts of progress happen we're we're in what seems like an accelerating cycle here where um these there's once this really rigid um universal view of yeah decades where weeks happen that's what it was and then weeks where decades happen um the everywhere like it started from one kind of universal perspective and then one little bit got chipped off and another bit and another bit and another bit and it started getting re remade and reformed and then that process started to accelerate and now things are being remade and reformed more and more rapidly which is causing a, a greater and greater destabilization god is dead and we have killed him said nietzsche stating a blunt truth about the west's nascent atheism Matthew Arnold captured the spirit of the age in these lines from his 1867 poem, Dover Beach. The sea, of, the sea of faith was once two at the full and round earth's shore, lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Despite the disillusionment of artists, philosophers, and other cultural producers, the 19th century was a time of great religious fervor in England and America. The Victorian era in England stretched from 1837 until the turn of the 20th century and featured a strong, featured a popular Christianity that was muscular, moralistic, and disciplined. It was notably civic-minded with a strong emphasis on social reform. This reformist evangelicalism spread to the United States, sparked the Third Great Awakening, which brought sparking the third great awakening which brought explosive growth in protestant churches and laid the groundwork for the social gospel movement rising european immigration brought catholics pouring into american cities by the hundreds of thousands the important changes though took place among the cultural elites who continued to shed any semblance of traditional christianity in america from 1870 through 1930 these elites worked what sociologist christian smith terms a secular revolution they harnessed the energy and tumult of industrialization to remake society along broadly progressive lines. The effects of this progressive movement on American religious life were vast. It began the long liberalization of mainline Protestantism by infusing it with a passion for social reform over and against personal piety and evangelizing. Progressives turfed the Protestant religious establishment out of universities and other leading cultural institutions. It pushed religion to the margins of public life, advocating science as the primary source of, of society's values and as a guide to social change. Within Christianity, it replaced the religious model of the human person with a psychological model centered on the self. As progressives' political ardor for greater democracy and egalitarianism found expression in church life by eroding the... Oh, and progressives' political ardor for greater democracy and egalitarianism found expression in church life by eroding the authority of the clergy and scripture. The 20th century arrived amid a wave of optimism about the West's future. It was a time of hope and faith and progress. The dream came to a catastrophic end in 1914 with the outbreak of the deadliest war had ever seen. The triumph of Eros. The mass savagery of World War I, four years of grinding combat that consumed the lives of 17 million soldiers and civilians, shattered European ideals and dealt a mortal blow to what remained of Christendom. This aftermath accelerated the abandonment of traditional sources of cultural authority. Sexual morality loosened. New styles of art and literature arose, making a conscious and definitive break with the discredited values of the pre-war world. Western civilization had been abandoning Christianity for quite some time, but it still had a sense of progress and purpose to unify it and to give its people direction and order to their lives. None of that progress, scientific, technological, economic, political, or social, prevented Europe from turning itself into a charnel house. This was the period in which the West moved from what sociologist Zygmunt Bauman called solid modernity, a period of social change that was still fairly predictable and manageable, to liquid modernity, our present condition, in which change is so rapid that no social institutions have time to solidify. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, found his true genius, not as a scientist, but as a quasi-religious figure who discerned and proclaimed the self as a deity to replace the Christian religion. Yet Freud's immense cultural authority depended on his role as an icon of science. 
Among secularized elites who disseminated Freud's views widely through mass media, Freud's vision had the force of revelation precisely because elites believed it to be scientific. So you're seeing here that scientific was, was um, like a secular study that pulled itself away from the church. And now it's appointing itself as becoming self-consciously appointing itself as a religion by having a, a prophet or a priest within it, like Freud, beginning to treat it more and more explicitly as a religious study. So you're seeing um, like the rise of a paganized Christianity, a paganized secular atheist Christianity that's centered around, it's rising up around this, what I've called this demon called the individual. It's a, it's a, 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 a demon that we've been in the West have been conditioned to believe in that each person has an individual. This is what the blank slate is in a person is the manifestation or the expression of the individual. And that the goal of human society, the goal of, 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 of social society is social society is to strip away everything within a person that makes that person a person to return back to the blank slate where there's nothing that differentiates one person from another. It's, it's creating a Borg. It's, it's literally dehumanizing. It's the dehumanization process of humanity, returning humanity to the status of NPCs. And you can see this as a, as a trajectory. That's what's so fascinating about this chapter to me is it it's tracing this line. These are not isolated events that are happening in a vacuum. History has a direction. It has a trajectory. And as you begin to map the trajectory back far enough, if, if you don't go back far enough, then you won't get a clear picture of the actual trajectory. You need more data points further and further back to be able to identify the rise and fall and the flow and the, the angle that everything's taking. And the further back that you go, the further, the, the further back you, you, you see and identify, the more you, can, you begin to be able to like map the pattern out and predict what's coming in the future. Um, so Freud's immense cultural authority depended on his role as an icon of science. Among secularized elites who disseminated Freud's views widely through mass media, Freud's vision had the power of um, Freud's vision had the force of revelation precisely because elites believed it to be scientific. To Freud, religion was nothing more than a man-made mechanism to cope with life and to manage instincts that, if allowed to run free, would make civilization impossible. Western man had lost God, and with that, a sense that there was a higher authority to give life ultimate meaning. But man had to get on with life somehow. Freud's answer was to replace religion with psychology. In his therapeutic vision, we should stop the fruitless searching for a non-existent source of meaning and instead seek self-fulfillment. The pursuit of happiness was not a quest for unity with God or sacrificial dedication to a cause greater than oneself, but rather a search to satisfy the self. In the past, a person looked outside himself to learn what he was to do with his life. But in modernity, when we know that religion and all claims of transcendent values are an illusion, we must look into ourselves for the secret to our own well-being. Psychology did not necessarily intend to change a man's character, but as in the old Christian therapies of repentance as a step toward conforming to God's will, Oh, let me read that again. Psychology did not necessarily intend to change a man's character, as in the old Christian therapies of repentance as a step toward conforming to God's will, but rather to help that man become comfortable with who he is. Sociologist Philip Reif, the great interpreter of Freud, described the shift in Western consciousness like this. Religious man was born to be saved. Psychological man is born to be pleased. The 1960s were the decade in which psychological man came fully into his own. In that decade, the freedom of the individual to fulfill his own desires became our cultural lodestar, and the rapid falling away of American morality from its Christian ideal began as a result. Despite a conservative backlash in the 1980s, psychological man won decisively and now owns the culture, including most churches, as surely as the Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Vandals, and other conquering peoples owned the remains of the Western Roman Empire. In 1966, at the beginning of this new age, Reef published a study called The Triumph of the Therapeutic, Uses of Faith After Freud, a book that still stuns with its prescience. In it, Reef, an unbeliever, argued that the West, amid unprecedented liberty and prosperity, was going through a profound cultural revolution. 
It had not become atheist, but it had spiritualized desire and embraced a secular gospel of self-fulfillment. Most people understood that Western culture had been slowly moving away from Christianity since the Enlightenment, but Reef said that the process had gone much further than most people realized. In Reef's theory of culture, a culture is defined by what it forbids. Each culture has its own order of therapy, a system that teaches its members what is permitted within its bounds and gives them sanctioned ways to let off the pressure of living by the community's rules, which are traditionally rooted in religion. Moreover, the asceticism in a culture that is the ideal of self-denial, cannot be an end in itself because that would destroy a culture. Rather, it must be a positive asceticism that links the individual negating his own particular desires to the, to the achievement of a higher positive life-affirming goal. The main thing that helps a culture survive, Reef wrote, is, quote, the power of its institutions to bind and loose men in the conduct of their affairs with reasons which sink so deep into the self that they become commonly and implicitly understood. A culture begins to die, he went on, when its normative institutions fail to communicate ideals in ways that remain inwardly compelling, first of all, to the cultural elites themselves. In other words, the Judeo culture, in other words, the Judeo-Christian culture of the West was dying because it no longer deeply believed in Christian sacred order with its thou shalt nots, and it had no way of agreeing on the thou shalt nots that every culture must have to restrain individual passions and direct them to socially beneficial ends. What made our condition so revolutionary, he said, was that for the first time in history, the West was attempting to build a culture on the absence of belief in a higher order that commanded our obedience. In other words, we were creating an anti-culture, one that made the foundation for a stable culture impossible. That is, instead of teaching us that we, what we must deprive ourselves of to be civilized, we have a culture built on a cult of desire, one that tells us that we find meaning and purpose in releasing ourselves from the old prohibitions as we self-directed individuals choose. This is, this is the full realization of libertarian theory. It's the same phenomenon. I had a tweet the other day that libertarians and, and communists are two wings of the same bird. And I did that explicitly because it, it, it uses one of their tropes against them. But you, you, can you see how clear this is? Can you see how much this is describing the philosophical underpinnings of the radical individualism and radical collectivism that are just two sides of the same coin? Quoting, Eros must be raised to the level of a religious cult in modern society, not because we really are that obsessed with it, but because the myth of freedom demands it, says political philosopher Stephen L. Gardner. It is in carnal desire that the modern individual believes he affirms his individuality. The body must be the true subject of desire because the individual must be the author of his own desire. The romantic ideal of the self, here's where I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to kind of censor just a little bit because I'm not ready to have the, 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 the channel taken down, but there's a very good chance of that based on some of what he's talking about. And frankly, even having some of this writing on the screen, I'm sure there's going to be some AI that picks up on it, but I'm going to drag this out as long as I can. The romantic ideal of the self-created man finds its fulfillment in the newest vanguards of the sexual revolution. I don't even know what to, what to censor myself with. Um, uh, <laughs> we'll say transmissions. That works. The romantic ideal of the self-created man finds its fulfillment in the newest vanguards of the sexual revolution, transmissions. They refuse to be bound by ideology, by, by, they refuse to be bound by biology and have behind them an elite movement teaching new generations that gender is whatever the choosing individual wants it to be. The advent of the birth control pill in the 1960s made it possible for mankind to extend its conquest and subjection of nature to the will to the human body itself. Transmissionism is the logical next step, after which will come the deconstruction of any obstructions in law or in custom to freely chosen polygamous arrangements. Remember, this was written in, in 2017. This is fairly prescient for that time, especially for a guy that's got a little bit of boomer con to him. Sure, there will be costs to extending the sexual revolution. We saw them in its first phase. The 1970s, the so-called me decade, was when the 1960s came to the rest of America. The divorce rate rising in the 1960s mushroomed in the 1970s. Abortion skyrocketed, but there was no going back. The new order found its constitutional confirmation in the Supreme Court's 1992 Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision, reaffirming abortion rights. 
Justice Anthony Kennedy, writing for the pro-choice majority, explained, no doubt unintentionally, how the sexual revolution depends on a radical, even nihilistic conception of freedom. Quoting, at the heart of liberty is the right to defend one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. That's, a, that's exactly what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about free will, that you don't have the freedom of will to define one's own concept of existence. That's incoherent. One does not have one's own concept of existence. It, 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 there is existence. And you could perceive it however you want, but you're not free to perceive it as other than what reality is. That's not freedom. That's slavery to delusion. Here is the end point of modernity. The autonomous, freely choosing individual finding meaning in no one but himself. The autonomous, freely choosing individual finding meaning in no one but himself. Philosopher Charles Taylor describes the cultural mindset that has captured us all. Everyone has a right to develop their own form of life grounded on their own sense of what is really important or of value. People, people are called upon to be true to themselves and to seek their own self-fulfillment. What this consists of, each must, in the last instance, determine for himself or herself. No one else can or should try to dictate its content. Of course, every age has had its morally lax people and people who have forsaken ideals and commitments to pursue their heart's desire. In fact, every one of us Christians is like that at times. It's called sin. What's distinct about the present age, says Taylor, is that, quote, today many people feel called to do this, feel they ought to do this, feel their lives would be somehow wasted or unfulfilled if they didn't do it. What is it? Following your own heart, no matter what society says, or the church, or anybody else. This kind of thinking is devastating to every kind of social stability, but especially to the church. The church, a community that authoritatively teaches and disciples its members, cannot withstand a revolution in which each member becomes, in effect, his own pope. Churches, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, that are nothing more than a loosely bound assembly of individuals committed to finding their own truth, are no longer the church in any meaningful sense because there is no shared belief. In this sense, Christians today may think we stand in opposition to secular culture, but in truth, we are as much creatures of our own time as secular people are. As Charles Taylor puts it, the entire ethical stance of moderns supposes and follows on from the death of God and, of course, of the meaningful cosmos. We may deny that God is dead, but to accept religious individualism and its theological support structure, moralistic therapeutic deism, is to declare that God may not be quite dead, but he is in hospice care and confined to the bed. Let's review a timeline of how the West arrived at this blasted heath of atomization, fragmentation, and unbelief. 14th century. The defeat of metaphysical realism by nominalism in medieval theological debates removed the linchpin think the linchpin linking the transcendent and the material worlds. In nominalism, the meaning of ob actions in the material world depends entirely on what man assigns it. War and plague brought the medieval system crashing down. 15th century. The Renaissance dawned with a new optimistic outlook on human potential. The Renaissance dawned with a new optimistic outlook on human potential and began shifting the West's vision, social imagination from God to man, whom it saw as the measure of all things. I, every time I hear that, I think of, of Da Vinci's, uh, I can't remember the name of it, the, but the, the drawing of the man that's with like all the measurements around him where it's like all of, all of reality can be deduced and understood in man as the measure of it, which is like, um, the ascendancy of man pl placing man on, on the throne. And there's, there's a truth in there that, um, man as an icon of God as created in the image and likeness of God has within him the, um, like the model or the archetype of the universe. But that's because man is a reflection of God. It's not because man is that in and of himself. And when man ceases to reflect God, he loses what it is that makes him man. So the worship of man actually is degrades man. The worship of man is the degradation of man. 16th century, the Reformation broke the religious unity of Europe. In Protestant lands, it birthed an unresolvable crisis in religious authority, which over the coming centuries would cause unending schisms. 
That's why I've started to actually just refer to it as the Protestant rebellion, because that's really what it was, which might not be all that charitable, but that really captures what motivated a lot of the sentiment within it. It was, it was just as um, political as, um, as it was religious. Because again, those are the same things. 17th century, the wars of religion resulted in the further discrediting of religion and the founding of the modern nation state. The scientific revolution struck the final blow to the organic medieval model of the cosmos, replacing it with a vision of the universe as a machine. The mind-body split proclaimed by Descartes applied this to the body. Man became alienated from the natural world. 18th century. The Enlightenment attempted to create a philosophical framework for living in and governing society absent religious reference. Reason would be the pole star of public life without religion, with religion, considered a burden from the Dark Ages, relegated to private life. The French and American revolutions broke with the old regimes and their hierarchies and, inaug and inaugurated a democratic egalitarian age. 19th century. The success of the Industrial Revolution pulverized the agrarian way of life uprooted masses from rural areas and brought them into the cities. Relations among people came to be defined by money. The romantic movement rebelled against this alienation in the name of individualism and passion. Atheism and Marxist influenced progressive social reforms spread among cultural elites. 20th century, the horrors of the two world wars severely damaged faith in the gods of reason and progress and in the God of Christianity. With the growth of technology and mass consumer society, people began to pay more attention to themselves and to, fill, to fulfilling their individual desires. The sexual revolution exalted the desiring individual as the center of the emerging social order, deposing an enfeebled Christianity as the Ostrogoths deposed the hapless last emperor of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century. The long journey from a medieval world racked with suffering but pregnant with meaning has delivered us to a place of once unimaginable comfort but emptied of significance and connection. The West has lost the golden thread that binds us to God, creation, and each other. Unless we find it again, there is no hope of halting our dissolution. Indeed, it is unlikely that the West will see this lifeline for a very long time. It is not looking for it and may no longer have the capability of seeing it. We have been loosed, but we do not know how to bind. To light a candle is to cast a shadow, said the writer Ursula K. Le Guin. The shadow of the Enlightenment's failure to replace God with reason has engulfed the West, and she plunged us into a new dark age. There is no way through this except to push forward to the true dawn. We who still hold the golden thread loosely in our hands must seize it more tightly and cling to it for future generations, or it will be torn from our grasp. Christians know that there is one light that the darkness can neither comprehend nor overcome, and it is that light to whom we must return if we are going to make it through this time of trial. This is the light, Jesus Christ, who illuminated the monasteries of the Middle Ages, and all those who gathered around them. The Benedictines had no secret teaching. They had what they still have, the rule, which shows how to order one's life to be as receptive as possible to God's grace, both individually and in community. As we await a new St. Benedict to appear in our quite different time and place and teach us how to reweave the tapestry of our Christian lives, let's make a pilgrimage to Benedict's hometown and spend time with the spiritual sons of the saints, who, in defiance of all modern expectations, are living simply but abundantly, guided by the timeless teaching of the old master. There we go. So that was the first, the introduction to the first two chapters of the Benedictine, the Benedictine option by Rod Dreher. Um, let me know if you guys would be interested in, in continuing to go through the book, um, reading on further from that. It's, it's less, at least I've gone, I think, two chapters beyond that. And it's more spiritual and less philosophical. Um, so uh, if you guys are interested in that, then I'd, I'd be happy to read through it. I have um, areas where I really agree with him and areas where I, I, I disagree or or I'd frame it in a, different, in a different way, kind of. So it may make for an interesting discussion. Um, what I've, I've got to I've run here, um, but I wanted to, number one, I want to address a comment that, that Jacob made here. Um, it was long, and so I wasn't able to fully read it as I was reading over there. Um, so I wanted to read through it and, and give it the, the attention it deserves. Um, and then I wanted to kind of uh, muse a little bit on something that he said toward the end there. So Jacob says, I guess Dreyer makes a fantastic critique of Descartes here. 
serpent in the garden, as you say, that alarms and convicts me. Yet I kind of can't really find a way to go about it any other way. I've always sought to know, how can I know the truth of any single thing ever? I feel like that's an appropriate epistemology, and I feel like Berkeley approached it perfectly well. But I feel like cogito er cogito ergo sum truly is the only thing we can be certain of. The, the prospect of solipsism epist epistemically sideswipes any other possible axiom, but not cogito ergo sum. I may be missing something, but Descartes was always dear to my heart for this reason. I was, I, that, that's kind of where I'd reason myself to um, when I sort of started this, this part of this journey over the year and a half ago or so, um, where I'd, I'd reasoned to um, the, the existence of the, the, the fact that I am self-aware, the fact that I seem to have self-awareness. I think that's what he's driving at is he's saying, um, the fact that I'm sitting here thinking about this is evidence to me that I'm sitting here thinking about this. And so if I'm going to try to reason somewhere, then I'm going to start off by acknowledging that I'm trying to reason somewhere, which begins with me trying to reason. The problem is that that's not fundamental. You're, you're, you're recognizing that that's where your awareness is kicking in, but necessarily there has to be something that pre-exists your awareness for there to be something worth reasoning to. Because if, if we're all just creatures in the imagination of a, a, um, a divine being, something like some kind of, uh, I can't remember the term for it, but like if, if, if that's all there is, then, then what, what is there, what's worth reasoning to? There's no, all these are just, just thoughts milling around in your head. They're, they're just, they're, they're chemical reactions. There's no meaning. There's no substance to them. And to me, my thought was with that was, well, okay, well then that makes them very profound because if there's no meaning to them, then if there's no meaning to anything that I think, then why am I thinking this versus that? That seems kind of like, why, what, what reason would I have to prefer one thing over another thing? There's some impulse within me driving at preferences, driving at a sense of goodness or a sense of truth. Um, I, I have this desire to create meaning. When I don't have it, I still desire it. If there's no meaning there, I still look for it. Why is that? And to, to, to speak to Descartes, he's like, okay, well, I'm reasoning, I'm rationalizing toward an end. Okay, why? What is the end that you're drawn toward? Something is drawing you to reason in the first place. You could not think. You could just be a blob that doesn't think. Why are you not that? There's some kind of, a, of an impulse. There's something that's pulling you. And for me, I just kind of started following that impulse. I, I, I felt that um, pulling on me and just yeah i don't really know what to say beyond that i just i felt this impulse that was pulling on me and i and i and i followed it the other thing that i wanted to to point out here yeah cooper says this is why we can't just start with an axiom because the epistemology falls apart this is so so true christian theology starts with christ it starts with and i'm not and i'm saying this in um like, I know there's people that would hear that and they, th okay, this is like religious talk, but no, this is like, if you want to understand reality, then you have to start with the fundamental principle of reality, the embodiment of the order of reality, which is the logos. The logos is a person. The, the, the Greeks thought about logos. They, they, they contemplated it. Aristotle contemplated it and discussed it and navigated around it. But what they didn't have the awareness of is that the logos is not just a thing. It's not just a disembodied principle. It's an actual person. There is a person who is the root of reality, that everything finds its expression in that person. This is the, Jacob, if you want an interesting, I know you you like this kind of thing. So if you want an interesting route of study, um, you I don't know if you've heard of him before, but St. Maximus the Confessor and his concept of the logi. That would be where I would I would point you. Study to to understand Saint Maximus's description of the logi, what the logi is. It, it was 
I haven't even read a lot of St. Maximus himself. I've gotten a lot of secondhand stuff of him, second and third hand. Cause it's, <laughs> I have a little brain. I have a little brain that's, that's, that's smoking and trying to keep up with this stuff. And, um, but it, it's, it's dramatically changed the way that I understand reality and I understand humanity's place within it. And this is what's been very profound to me personally with orthodoxy. It's something that I haven't found, I haven't seen in any of Western Christianity. Western Christianity has pieces of it. Some have more pieces than others. But the everything that we just read was all focused on the West. This was all an evolution of, of thought happening in the West that didn't happen in the East. The East never had a Reformation. The East never had an enlightenment or a renaissance really to speak of. This is what was so fascinating to me about the Orthodox liturgy that the Orthodox church today, every Sunday is doing the exact same liturgy that it's been doing for like 1600 years. And all the Orthodox churches are doing this, this liturgy. They're preserving this tradition that is like from the fall of Rome the same tradition. It hasn't been appreciably updated or modified or um, added to or deconstructed. There isn't the impulse to, to have to strip everything down to its constituent components and determine the mechanics of every last little thing. Because that's what I want to do. That's what I'm drawn toward. But I recognize the temptation in that. Some things are mysteries which doesn't mean that you just don't think about them. Actually, you do think about them. That's the point. It's a mystery. So you sit and you contemplate the mystery, but you don't have to deconstruct the mystery to try to pick out the mechanics within it. Because some of them, we simply aren't capable of, of understanding or put a different way, our capacity for understanding them depends upon our meditating upon them and not our deconstruction of them. If you un want to understand the fundamental nature of reality, you have to understand your relationship to the Logos, which is the fundamental principle, um, uh, uh, ordering cause. Um, we, we don't really have a word or a phrase in English that, that communicates what the biblical concept of the Logos is, or even the Greek concept of the Logos. It's, it's, we have to, we kind of talk around it with a bunch of different words, but this is this has been the 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 trajectory that I've been on. And if I just had read this book like when it was written, I could have skipped a lot of the um blood, sweat, and tears over the last few years trying to rack my my brain to figure this out. However, I don't regret it because suffering again is the uh the language. Like we don't need an explanation of or or a solution to suffering. Suffering is the solution itself. Through suffering, God speaks to you. It's it, I call it that simple. It's not simple necessarily, but when you suffer, you see God. God manifests himself through the suffering that we experience. So running away from suffering is running away from God. When you lean into the suffering, when you embrace it, you accept it, and you maximize it, you see God. Anyways, um, I got to run here, guys. This has been, this has been a long one. Um, but uh, let me know what you think of this. Uh, uh, what, what, what you think of this reading? Give me your thoughts. I'm, I, I, I want to know what other people think because I, I think through other people. That's why I have to come on here and, and, and do streams and why I, I start withering when I don't do them because um, it's just thoughts get backed up in my own head and I need to get them out. I need to take in other people's thoughts. I'm like a, like a thought vampire. So um, tell me what you think. Uh, go follow me on Twitter at real King pilled um, subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it, do all the YouTube stuff. Um, and, uh, and donate to our sponsors, uh, Mises GOP.org uh, slash King and uh, Paloma Verde CBD.com um, promo code King. Uh, we appreciate you supporting us and uh, you get good stuff out of it as well. So, yeah, I think that's about it. I will talk to you guys next.